Okay, good morning. This is the June 25th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Bank Foundation of Walnut Creek. Uh, roll call, please, Deborah. Certainly. Kelso? Here. Dumpfell? Here. Darrington? Here. Walker? Here. Adams? Here. Anderson? Here. Brown? Here. Clarity? Here. Kikuchi? Here. O'Keefe. Thank you. We have two sets of minutes to approve. Uh, first is May 28th. Do I see anybody who, have any, uh, who has a comment about that or correction? Seeing none, they're approved as written. Then we have June 9th. Any comments, corrections for those? Seeing none, they're approved as written. Uh, now we'll hear from Mayor Haskew about uh, Walnut Creek. You're yeah, muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not sure which of my devices I am coming through on. Um, good morning, board chair uh, uh, Kelso and the board and the residents of Walnut Creek. Um, it's a delight to be here as always. And I have a few things that I'd like to follow up with you. Um, the first is a reminder that for all of the COVID rules that uh, officiate over how we respond, those are set by the county and the city does maintain a website that announces our um, understanding of the uh, announcements from the county as quickly as we can get it on there, but you can also check on the county website um, where the most official of the, of the reports are going to be um, freeing you to do whatever it is that you now plan to do. Again, I point out that we're approaching, I'm gonna try turning off my... Oh, we lost your audio. Okay. All right, I thought I, thought I was off the uh, phone, but I'm still on it. Um, uh, I'm I again remind you that this is the end of the fiscal year of Walnut Creek and the combined adjustment that we have to make uh, between the fall of the revenue for fiscal year 2019, fiscal year uh, 220 um, will be approximately 25 million and we're pretty confident we've figured out the um, end of this year's balancing measures and we've got some really hard work ahead of us to figure out how to balance the, the other uh, coming year. Um, I am part of the rebound project of the City Council and our first phase was to encourage uh, downtown restaurant development and opening and if any of you have managed to be downtown you'll see that it's getting to be a much more lively place. There are several restaurants along Locust and Main that have um, instituted pop-ups uh, in, in the parking space um, areas that are now seating areas and people seem to be really enjoying the outdoor dining. We've also closed off part of Lincoln, um, which is uh, the street um, in between changes and the building that has that strange fashion store um, across the street from the library. Um, that has closed, we've closed off the end of that and there is a combination dining from the sports bar and from OPA. And we have many more plans on our way to making it exciting. I ventured forth for my first out of immediate essential jobs last night and had dinner with my spouse at rooftop. And it was um, easier and harder than I thought it was going to be, but it led to a nicely enjoyable evening. Um, let's see. I am thinking that you probably want some response of, from the city as to the 
protests that have been held and a little bit about the police response. The very first protest was held, I think, on Friday of that week, uh, where 35 people stood on the corner of Ignacio and Civic with signs, and it was so quiet it went by completely unnoticed. As a matter of fact, I'm told the police did help them and, and support them in their protest. The next one of note was the one that happened, and I am hard-pressed to call it a protest. I am going to call it essentially criminal behavior, which occurred at Broadway Plaza. That was an extremely difficult um, event for the police to handle because they were getting, they monitored her uh, chatter on social media, and they were getting many different um, descriptions of it. And so it was very difficult for them to prepare completely, as many would say, appropriately. They did, in my opinion, a fantastic job giving with what they worked with. There were approximately, when all was said and done, 600 people participating in the looting, even with mutual aid from other police departments, there were only 200 police officers, and they had to make a choice whether they were going to um, hold and make sure that it was not going to turn violent, or whether they um, would go in and immediately start arresting people. The decision was made to hold for two reasons, one of which was it would have, it would have seriously depleted the forces if they'd um, gone in. And the second reason was they were also getting chatter that afterwards the looters were going to go into Walnut Creek neighborhoods and the police uh, decided to keep a border around the area so that it was limited um, to just where they were for the worst part of the evening. <laughs> the next day was the day that we had a protest, a large thousand or so people protest that started out um, absolutely as promised peaceful. It, the police, having dealt with the night before, were, I think, pretty concerned, and rightfully so, about how things could turn. And so they asked for mutual aid to wait with them, and they made it known that they were in the area, hoping to keep it at a peaceful level. It worked. For almost all of that protest session, um, it was peaceful. It was only after it really officially ended, and uh, the, the crowd split up into a couple of different sections, and one section of it decided to go on the freeway. I don't know about you, but I would have been royally angry at my son if he allowed people to lead him onto a freeway which was an innately dangerous place to be. Cars had to be stopped that were speeding at 70 miles an hour. Um, there are varying stories about, um, now let me go back a little bit. Um, the freeway is under the jurisdiction of the Highway Patrol. So Walnut Creek called the Highway Patrol, and the Highway Patrol did manage to stop most of the traffic and the, the protesters went on the freeway. They circled the two highway patrol cars, and the highway patrol cars um, said, please, we need help. And that's when um, the, the excitement, um, disaster, all of the words that you want to apply to it happened. Um, the, Protesters, uh, there was also a curfew issue. See, this isn't very simple. There was also a curfew issue, and the cur 
curfew was ordered so that the police had some reason to gather the protesters and take them back where they were safe, and and the protesters didn't want to move. Um, I'm going to sound a little disconcerted because I have two issues that we need to talk about, one of which is the tear gas and one of which is the uh, police dog. I'm going to do the police dog first. The police dog was one was uh, with a, a mutual aid city. The person who was attacked was ordered to disperse, defied the order, threw back a empty can of tear gas at the officer, and the officer let the dog go. There have since been meetings with all of the mutual aid police in the area to ban dogs from these situations. They will not be allowed to bring any dogs ever to these again. So it was a hard lesson to learn. I wish we didn't have to have learned it, um, but it is a lesson well learned and put to bed. The second is tear gas, and it is um, got it's gotten a lot of press about its being uh, a war, a war um, banned from war. Um, it is not banned from police situations. It is absolutely legal. The issue is when do you use it? And as one officer said. If we have nothing to enforce a disbandment movement offer, nobody would do anything and no issue would ever be resolved. They are going to be more conscious of, of the optics. They're going to be more conscious of when it should be. But at certain circumstances, it is a viable tool for the police officers to use, and I don't foresee that the city will take up completely banning it. Um, the police chief has an advisory committee, and they are going to delve in with great depth um, into what is happening, what happened, the investigations related to these Two events are still largely underway. There have been some arrests in the looting situation. Um, it's going to take months for us to sort everything out and get to an understanding of cause and effect. But messages have been heard by the council. Messages have been heard by the police department. Changes have been made in procedures, and we are going to do much better. I will now take you to the next two protests. The first of the two protests after that was one held in Civic Park again. The police had a far less presence when it was happening, and it went absolutely as our Constitution writers wanted it to do. It was a peaceful, legal assembly. Can you hear me now? Okay. It was absolutely a peaceful, legal assembly, and we are very proud of the participants. We are proud of our police officers, and I record that in the box as a success all around. Now there's the one that was my personal experience, which was the protest that occurred in my front yard at 10 o'clock on Wednesday night. It's hard to sort out all my feelings about this. Um, it, it, I, we did understand there was a chance that it would occur. It did occur. It was a lot of people, 200 to maybe more, in my front yard. There were pails of paint dumped in front of my garage. My garage door was kicked in 
so badly we have to replace it. Um, they did damage. They did trespass. Um, they did vandalize. They burned a Blue Lives Matter flag on my go- on my driveway, and and um, they scared the heck out of my neighbors. Um, they were the police yet again were restrained, watchful but careful. The police made it possible for them to take up all of the uh, lanes on Ignacio, a significant a route of significance for our, our county, um, to and from. Uh, they did not intervene because uh, even though there was vandalism and, and um, trespass, they decided that it was better to let it play out, and I totally support their decision. And in overall feeling, truth is, if a garage door and replacing sprinklers and cleaning up paint is a good investment in making people understand that I totally, personally believe Black Lives Matter, totally believe in social and racial justice, then it was a good investment to make. I'm fine. My husband's fine. It took us a while to get through the adrenaline rush of the two days thereafter, but it's done and it's over with. Um, A good lesson, I think, for all. On another note, we have um, the potential, the council has voted to form a diversity committee or commission to help achieve the role of diversity in Walnut Creek and to help us figure out how to further implement social and racial justice in our community. That's it. I hope I'm ending on a happy note. Um, I'm open for any questions, and I actually should have asked every time I've been here if there are questions. Um, I apologize if I did not, but feel free. Any questions for Mayor Haskew? Carl. Yes, Mayor. I'm wondering, since recent studies have shown that the looting was a separate group from the protesters, at least according to things, are the police making any adjustments in their tactics to realize that uh, the protest and the looting are separate events? Yes, and I'm sorry I wasn't clear about that exactly. Um, they were, uh, even even when there was the, the diversion to the freeway, the actual protest event was peaceful. Um, there was dialogue with the police and the protesters, and all of it mostly was friendly. Apparently, some of the protesters did spit on the police um, and treat them disrespectfully, but the police held tight in their... Um, uh, objective to uh, respect their the protesters' rights and allow the the event to go on. Yes, Any other questions? I also make a comment that uh, I think it's it's wrong if a person is in a public thing they shouldn't have gone to your house. <laughs> Thank you. I actually agree with you. Any other questions for Mayor Haskew? Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, Good luck in the next month, and we'll see you at uh, the end of July. Yes, you will, and thank you very much. And um, if anybody would like to do, um, to communicate with me, please um, email me at mayor at walnut-creek.org. Thank you. Thanks. Now the uh, treasurer's report from Dwight. Good morning. I'm going to open up a screen here to share something, I think. Um, And maybe not. All right. So let me let me just do a uh, uh, an overview. So you all have a copy of the treasurer's report in front of you in the agenda. 
And I think that uh, there, there are several takeaways. One, first of all, our cash position is in a strong position uh, because we have uh, the proceeds from the Paycheck Protection Loan, uh, and that has helped us through this crisis, um, a financial crisis. And it is a crisis because when you look at revenue across all three of our funds, uh, we're about $1.2 million short uh, through the end of May and short of budget. And um, there are several uh, implications to that. The first is the GRF uh, operations fund. The variance uh, revenue shortfall is 441,000, but uh, due to strong efforts on the part of uh, Tim and his team, uh, they have uh, saved uh, expenses, 585,000 compared to budget. So actually through the end of May, uh, we're at 144,000 surplus uh, to budget in the GRF operations fund. So. Um, kudos to management for making that happen. Biggest shortfall in revenue is uh, golf with 152,000 and the biggest savings is in salaries. Uh, the next area is MOD where uh, revenue has fallen short by 260,000 uh, through the end of May. Uh, as everybody recalls, MOD was shut down uh, for a, a period of time and didn't get back up until May the 5th. So we're still seeing uh, the results of that um, uh, Paul Donner and, and uh, Rick Chakoff are, are um, thinking that they should be back to a break-even situation by the end of the year. So that's the goal in MOD. Uh, the third area is the trust estate fund. Uh, member transfer fees, uh, as everybody knows, are, are tied to uh, property sales. Uh, through the end of May, we are about $400,000 short of uh, uh, revenue that we had forecasted. Uh, and we don't know where property sales are going to go for the rest of the year. Uh, the, the trust estate fund chart, and Deborah, if you could go down to the bottom of that page, thank you, um, is really important for us to all understand. Uh, the green bars show the revenue that was uh, projected at the beginning of the year, uh, 4.8 million. Uh, in assuming that um, property sales remain where they are for April and May through the rest of the year, uh, revenue could potentially only be 3.2 million. Uh, the one thing that does not change is debt service. As you see, 2.1 million, whether um, it's green or blue, it's the same number. Capital projects were originally approved at 4.3 million. You can see that green bar, but um, the board and management have put a stop on spending and the projects on hold as of June 16th were 2.2 million. Uh, so the ending cash balance as projected with this current forecast, the, the bar to the, the blue bar to the right, uh, 2.8 million. And there'll be a discussion later on that today. So um, everybody is uh, managing through uh, this situation. It's still a financial challenge, uh, but I know that uh, everybody's looking to maximize revenue and minimize expenses. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Dwight. CEO's report, Tim. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to first talk about uh, kind of a follow up to what I talked about last month, and, and that is adjusting to this new normal. The um, in last month's report since May 20th, which was the date I published last uh, month's report, COVID-19 has proceeded on its deadly course with a 50% increase in infections that have affected the lives of an additional 785,000 more Americans just in that five week period. Total infections are now in excess of 2.3 million in the United States, resulting in more than 121,000 deaths. There remains no therapy, no cure, and no vaccine for this disease. Federal, state, and local governments are opening up new sectors of the economy every day. And not surprisingly, the increased infections and deaths in California and Contra Costa hit record highs yesterday. In just the last seven days, infections in Contra Costa are 52% higher than the previous seven day record, which was achieved just the week before. Some residents here in Rossmore are anxious to resume their lives and get back to their clubs and their dinner parties and their fitness routines and their entertainment. Just last night, I received an email from a resident demanding to open up our facilities because quote, we're adults capable of making individual decisions to social distance or not. We've also heard from others who are much more reticent to expose themselves to the ever-present risk and wonder why Golden Rain is opening up any facilities at all. As I've explained previously, 
GRF is not a health provider. We're obligated to follow the health orders like every other entity in the county and the state. We look to the public health officials to delineate the restrictions and then we design our safety protocols with their guidance that is specific to our facilities and the populations that we serve with 100% of our residents in the high risk category, which is significantly different than the general population that the county's health orders are addressing. When facilities start opening back up, we'll have safeguards in place to minimize the risk to residents and staff but all residents need to be aware that these safety protocols will not completely eliminate the risk. These inconvenient but necessary precautions, social distancing, masks, washing hands, staying home if sick, remaining sheltered except for essential activities, will likely be with us for many more months, maybe even years, since they're the only tools that public health officials can provide us at this time to minimize the risk. Every resident in and outside of Rossmar will have to make the difficult decision whether to resume life as we knew it or we want it to be, or to remain sheltered as much as possible. And this new normal leaves us with not many attractive choices. A number of residents have contacted me demanding that we do something about the defiant ones, those who don't appear to be social distancing or wearing masks and practically flaunting their freedom to do so as they please. And at least that's how people have characterized it to me. The harsh reality is that there's not much that we can do. The police are unlikely to arrest anybody. Golden Rain is prevented by the order from enforcing the health orders. But even if we could, these residents have made the personal choice to roll the dice and accept the risk. So where does that leave you if you're concerned about this, which I think everybody, most people are. Steer clear. They may even be your friends and you may have received the great benefits of friendship for many years with, the, with these people but what you don't wanna receive from them is COVID-19. Until this is over, we need to chart our own course, determine the level of risk that you're willing to accept, modify your habits and lifestyle accordingly, and hopefully we'll get through all of this together. So next I wanna talk about how health county orders, or the county health orders are implemented in Rossmore. We continue to get a lot of complaints from residents who are upset about whatever the rules are on the golf course or the rules in the swimming pools, and they've been changing, so it makes it even more confusing and challenging for both staff and for residents. What many people don't seem to realize is that the amenities that have been allowed to open have, in most cases, very specific and strict requirements imposed or strongly encouraged by the county health department. GRF and every resident are legally required to adhere to the health orders. To the extent that the health orders are not specific, the county refers us to state guidelines or other industry specific guidelines that may have been developed or vetted by national groups like the PGA for golf or federal entities like OSHA or the CDC. When other amenities are allowed to open like the fitness center or the clubhouses, there will be additional restrictions and impositions that will be in place until there is a treatment cure and a vaccine. These facilities will not operate as they were pre-pandemic, so don't expect them to be. There will be inconveniences and impositions. There may even be intrusive measures like temperature readings and time limits of use. We simply don't know yet what the county will mandate and how we will adapt our facilities. I'd like everybody to understand that when the health orders change, which can sometimes be more than once a week, they have to be reviewed the protocols have to be developed, then the standards have to be communicated to residents, then the staff have to be trained before any of the facilities can be reopened. Unfortunately, the county does not provide advance notice of any of their changes or what the restrictions will be once facilities are allowed to reopen, so we're in a constant state of wait and see. We'll do our best to plan and anticipate with what we know may have been approved in other counties or states, but the final word comes from the county health department. Then we pivot, we react and then we seek clarification from the health officers before we do any of the steps that I've just outlined. We'll continue to monitor the changes from the health orders and the pronouncements from the public health officials and we'll adjust our protocols accordingly to minimize the risk for our residents and staff. And in the meantime, we'd ask that everybody please be patient with each other. I've heard lots of stories about people being very upset about the behaviors of friends or or neighbors that they're passing on the street, on the sidewalk, or on the golf course. Also ask you to be patient with the staff. We are not making the rules. The county makes the rules. We're trying to design the protocols around those rules. These are difficult circumstances for everyone, and we appreciate everybody's understanding. Now, the mayor, we heard talked about the protests, and, and um, we've had some protests here in Rossmore. 
Millions of people worldwide have been outraged about the death of George Floyd and other African Americans and the long overdue reckoning over the treatment of non-white people and not just the criminal justice and law enforcement, but in many facets of society has clearly touched a nerve nationwide and here, and here in Rossmore. Golden Rain has heard from many residents in support of the protest, and we've also heard from a few who are angered by them. Since there have been several protests staged by residents in Rossmore with some reports of potentially unsafe conditions, Golden Rain wants to be sure that protesters and vehicles on the roadway are safe. The policy committee at its July 7th meeting will be considering whether to establish some rules for future protests in Rossmore. All residents are invited to the meeting and to provide suggestions during the resident forum. Watch the Rossmore News for the Zoom information. I want to briefly touch on, I've, I've dealt with this uh, in detail in the past, and uh, Dwight Walker, the treasurer, just mentioned this, but I want to just highlight a couple of things here. Keep in mind that Golden Rain facilities were closed for nearly eight weeks with the corresponding loss of, a, of approximately a half million dollars in fee revenue through the end of May. The financial results, as Dwight reported, were $144,000 ahead of budget, and that was due to the board and the staff's quick action to reduce expenses and suspend or cancel non-essential expenditures. We do not know exactly how this is going to play out for the rest of the year, but I want the community to know that the board, the finance committee, and the staff are carefully monitoring the financial situation with updated forecasting as the health orders change. I want to talk about the fitness center. There's been some confusion about when the, uh, the Tice Creek Fitness Center will reopen. It's the most heavily used amenity in Rossmore by far, and there's obviously a keen interest from thousands of residents here about when it's gonna open. There was an article in the June 17th Rossmore News that stated as fact that we would open on July 1. That actually was not true. The, that was a target date that the county had established um, several weeks ago where gyms might be open. So to be clear, the County Health Services Department in their press release a few weeks ago said that July 1 was a target date to open gyms and fitness centers, but the county went on to qualify that by saying that this date was subject to change based on underlying health factors that will be reevaluated prior to that date. They have still not announced formally when gyms and fitness centers can reopen. And obviously, since they haven't announced it, we don't know yet what those restrictions are gonna be. So, uh, and we anticipate that there's going to be an extensive list of restrictions for both users of those facilities as well as the operators, which would be the Golden Main Foundation. Once the county releases the health order for the gyms, we'll carefully review and then we'll consult with the county. We'll design the safety protocols, we'll communicate them to the community, we'll train the staff, and then we'll reopen. This could all take up to a week or more after the order is published. We'll keep you informed via Nixle and the website, so stay tuned. I'd also like to announce the Tice Creek Indoor Pool will open later today at one o'clock. So if you are interested in swimming indoors at the Tice Creek Pool, you can go to our website at www.ticefitnesscenter.com, all one word. And you can make a reservation online if you already have an account with the fitness center. If you don't have an account, you can set one up on the website or you can call, and I'm gonna give you the phone number. It's 925 988-7850 to schedule an appointment to use the Tice Creek indoor pools. You can find out more information and the pool rules at rossmore.com slash breaking hyphen news. That's our on our website. If you go to the main page, you'll see a bar at the top of the page. Click the bar and it'll take you right to the, uh, the press release announcement around the opening of the pool. The last item in my report is employee transitions. We had three employees leave employment with Golden Rain in May. Manuel Merguia, a roofer in the building maintenance department. Miranda Nyber, a news carrier with the Rossmore News. And Margaret Busaferi, the assistant managing editor of the Rossmore News. And that's my report. Thanks, Tim. Are there any questions for Tim? Dale. Just a minute. Just a minute. Tim. Yes, Dale. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Tim, I, I support everything you've been doing. And I believe we should continue to do what the county provides to us. Although when they state allowed rather than required, then with the allowed, we might move more slowly based upon our population. We certainly will be criticized by some 
who want to rush ahead, but the safety of our vulnerable population must take precedence. Thanks, Dale. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the meeting. I have an agenda item for the board to discuss, um, really to provide some guidance as to what the board's preferences are as we begin to open up some of these facilities. Carl? Yes. What are the plans to enforce the maximum occupancy limits in the fitness center? Well, we don't know yet. The county hasn't given us any guidance yet. We don't know what the whether they're going to have a, a space disc, you know, like um, the swimming pools have a limit of the number of people per square feet of water. We don't know if they will impose that over the square feet, say, of a fitness center. We don't know if they'll just say, you know, a six foot minimum distance. We don't know. They haven't they haven't given a heads up about any of this yet. So as soon as they issue the health order, we will review it. And we will then clarify with the health department um, our, for our specific population uh, what their recommendations might be. And then we will design our pr protocols around it. As I said, we'll, then we'll communicate that to the, to the community and then we will train our staff. Yeah, I guess my concern is if we have to do something like limit the number of people in the fitness center, we probably have to have a reservation system and it, to me, it seems like a logistic nightmare to empty out the fitness center and then check everybody in again. Uh, I just see that I think we need to do some potential what if planning to make sure that uh, it'll run smoothly and can maximize everybody's experience for the fitness center. Yeah, and we, we're doing, as I said in my report, we're, we're trying to pay attention to what other counties have allowed already around, around any of the opening of any of these facilities. And, um, and then, and we are anticipating that there will be a reservation system. Again, we don't know yet what the county's requirements are. And so until we know we really can't, um, we can't plan definitively. We're, we're planning on contingencies, but we don't know yet until the health order is issued. Any other questions for Tim? <clears throat> Ken? Yeah, Tim gave the board credit for jumping on these COVID-19 precautions as soon as they did. I'd like to bounce that credit back to the staff. They're the ones who jumped on it so immediately. And I think is one of the main reasons why we have no known cases of, of coronavirus uh, today. So the credit really belongs to the staff, I think. Thanks, Ken. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Tim. Yeah. So we're going to go to the residents forum. But before we hear from the residents, I'd like to make a few comments. First, the changes to the golf course hours that we voted on in April and that we will address today are temporary. They aren't going to impact home values. Second, we understand that there have been problems with walkers on the golf course outside of the hours with which, in which they're allowed. We've stepped up patrols by marshals, put up more signs and asked secured us to respond more quickly as long as they aren't on an emergency call. I ask walkers to thank a golfer for supporting two beautiful golf courses and to respect the times posted. It is dangerous and inconsiderate to be on the course when golfers are playing. Third, approximately 50% of the cost of the golf course is subsidized by non-golfers. I know, I know golfers pay extra money to play golf, but that amount would double if the rest of the residents didn't subsidize it. I would ask the golfers to rejoice that you have 100% of the tee times available on dollar and 75% of the tee times on Creekside. I know it isn't perfect, but many people rely on the fitness center and have 0% of their time back there. Consider it a kind of karmic good deed that you are sharing a little bit of the golf course with other residents. One thing I think golfers and walkers can agree on is that Mark and his staff do an incredible job keeping the golf course beautiful. And one other announcement, Unfortunately, due to the length of the meeting today, I've had to cancel the Q&A this afternoon. I will have a Q&A session next week, and from then on, it's going to be monthly, the week after the board meeting, the first week of the month, uh, from two to three. Uh, so Lisa, uh, do we have any people in the residence forum? We do. Uh, as a reminder, residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residence forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented and members do consider them as they act during the meeting. If you wish to address the board, 
please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connecting via phone audio only now. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residents forum. Once the residents forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. We have three speakers, uh, four, sorry, four speakers ready to speak in the forum. Our first is uh, Eric. Eric, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Uh, please state your full name and Rossmore address. Thank you very much, Eric Cox, 1125 Stanley Dollar Drive, number four. Uh, thank the board for uh, listening to us all. And I really want to give congratulations to Tim O'Keefe, the board and staff for an amazingly competent uh, handling of this COVID crisis. Um, obviously, everyone's attention is involved in the COVID crisis and most recently the protest. Um, but if we turn around and look at our hills, our beautiful green hills of now, turn brown and I just want to bring attention to this. We're now in the early stages of fire season. The Cal, uh, Cal Fire officials project this will easily be as bad or could possibly be worse than the last fire, fire season. Uh, I wanna con commend Dennis Bell and Rebecca landscaping crews and contractors for the great work they're doing on fire roads, uh, fuels mitigation inside Rossmore and on the boundaries. This is good work. But nevertheless, there are no guarantees. Rossmore is smack dab in the middle of what's called the urban wildlife, uh, wildlands interface. Big fires can always happen. At least we forget paradise only two years ago. 86 residents died and the average age of those residents was between 70 and 90 years old. Paradise was also compounded with the fact they didn't have enough evacuation roads. And I think Rossmore is, faces a similar dilemma. To this concern, my main question, are there plans in Rossmore to hold evacuation and fire drills? I know the last few years we've had uh, many tabletop sessions, but I'm not aware of any physical evacuation and fire drills, which I think would make the Rossmore residents far more comfortable and feel this is a danger that's being addressed. Um, my other concern, I don't know how much time I have left, was, was just about the... One minute. Uh, one minute? Okay. Mm -hmm. The water treatment facility, um, we don't want to lose the golf course. Everyone's concerned. But are the residents informed of the long-range financial impact that 11 or $13 million might have on their coupons? Um, I know in communities, normally when infrastructure uh, improvements are made, bonds are passed, votes are taken in the community. Is there any um, plan to notify everyone by mail with all the intricate details and financial obligations that this project may entail? I think it would be good if we knew everyone was educated. The newspaper is great, but I'm not sure everyone uh, learn, you know, gets all the information. And uh, those are my two main concerns. And thank you very much for all your good work. Thank you, Eric. Um, our next uh, forum speaker is Mary. Mary, I've allowed you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. And then you have three minutes to address the board. Hi, uh, first of all, my name is Mary Ramos. I'm at 2145 Ptarmigan. Uh, number one. And I do want to thank the board for all your efforts and the staff. Um, I do have concerns about a policy that might be forming that we become more restrictive than the county. I think our county is very restrictive. And I, I believe residents need choice. And if we don't have choice, what will end up happening is you will find residents leaving Rossmore, going to counties where there are more choices for pleasurable activities, and then they will bring 
whatever exposure they have somewhere else into Rossmore. And I think that should be as big a concern as being uh, more restrictive because you could be creating an in, influx of COVID because people leave the area for the activities instead of staying in this wonderful place we all purchased and uh, having access to, to the facilities here. And as far as the safety of those that are very uh, vulnerable, that's a personal responsibility because they're vulnerable whether there's COVID or there isn't COVID and they they have to restrict their own activities. Um, and let's see, what else did I have? Uh, I think uh, uh, having the facilities here and opening up our amenities is important to those who purchased it. I realize that we have to take safety protocols, but it all comes down to a choice. I haven't been here that long. And for a while, I felt like I purchased a giant coffin because I had the shelter in place. And I'm going, oh my goodness, I moved here to be a close. I mean, I was with my family and then I moved here and couldn't see them. And I realized that we needed to modify, but now we need to get back to real life. We don't have 20 or 10 more years to enjoy life. Our life is now to enjoy. Anyway, thank you very much. I realize you're all doing a lot of work for us and analyzing, but uh, let's think of the cost of being more restrictive and people leaving our area and then coming back. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next resident forum speaker is Diane. Diane, please, I've allowed you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address, and you have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. Um, my name is Diane Beeson. I live at 3443 Terra Granada Drive, apartment 1B. Uh, I'd really like to thank the board uh, for permitting non-golfers who subsidize the co cost of the golf course, uh, a small window of time to walk on the Creekside course. I'm a retired professor of social psychology and today I want to address the mental health issues at stake in your decision about Creekside. My husband and I moved here hoping to expand our social interaction and to prevent the isolation of many elders, uh, to prevent the isolation that, that many elders in our society face. But now of course, due to the pandemic, this isolation is intensified and most opportunities for socializing are closed to us. This week, an article in the medical journal Lancet emphasized the psychological costs of quarantine measures on older people. They include confusion, anger, insomnia, anxiety, and depression, all of which affect morbidity and mortality. The importance of an additional two hours of walking time at Creekside is not only that they provide a safe level place to exercise while social distancing without worrying about curbs and traffics. But they have permitted a specific time and place for many of us to socialize safely with friends and neighbors in both planned and chance meetings. Or to see in person the children and grandchildren we can no longer invite into our homes or even hug. Walking on Creekside has become what one friend calls her get out of jail card. Another meets daily at four for a chat and walk with her adult daughter. Some friends sitting on a golf course bench were approached by a woman the other day who asked, may I talk to you? I have no one. And then who proceeded to share some of the challenges of her isolation. So opening the golf course to walkers is one small step toward reducing the isolation and despair of many of our residents. I urge you, please don't take that away from us. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, our, very, our, ne our next and last resident forum speaker is Chloe. Chloe, I've allowed you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address and you have three minutes to address the board. 
Yes, thank you. My name is Chloe Camprath, and I am at 1124 Singing Wood Court, number one. Um, I recently wrote a letter to the board and to uh, Tim O'Keefe and wanted to thank Tim for his uh, thoughtful response. And I do feel that the board is, has been responding. I'm one of the walkers who wants to stay walking if I can there. Uh, I also appreciate what um, uh, Robert Kelso said in, in talking about it. And, and so I've eliminated some of what I wanted to say about what's a community. But the main thing I want to say is a community has compassion, collaboration, and, co and compromise. And I, um, I feel like it's important that we continue and that, that, that we can continue to have um, the, the, the connection on the golf course that we can say hello just as we pass by. And I'd like further in the future to talk about how we can increase this, not the use of the golf course, I'm not talking about that, but how we can, can um, encourage further community connection. And I guess that's all for this morning, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to address the board, Clo. Uh, that's all the speakers we have in the, Ross, in the residence forum, Bob. Thank you, Lisa. And now we'll hear from uh, Bill Dorband on the Finance Committee report. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the Finance Committee met on June 23rd via Zoom webinar. Director of Golf Mark Heptig reviewed the status of golf revenue and losses and or golf revenue losses and expense savings currently underway. He indicated that he will request from the board some modifications to current procedures that might increase revenue in the future. The committee endorses any efforts to increase golf revenue. We reviewed projections both in the operating fund and the trust estate fund. While some activities are picking up to help restore revenue to historic normal levels, expenses have been reduced and deferred. We are still not back to normal levels of financial activity. Uh, the committee urges caution in any current proposed expenditures. Keeping that in mind, the committee reviewed requests by staff to recommend to the board that there, are, that there be currently sufficient funds to proceed with three expenditures from the trust estate fund. After discussions that included examination of available funds and recognition of the lower MTF, a membership transfer fees being collected, the committee makes the following recommendations. One, there are sufficient funds for the gateway HVAC project in the amount of $615,000. Two, there are sufficient funds for the 40 by 40 tent in the amount of $6,000. However, the committee feels that there are not sufficient funds at this time for the next phase of the satellite wastewater recycle facility in the amount of $175,000, given the uncertain level of MTF revenue currently projected and becoming aware that such expenditure may be getting cl us close to the targeted minimum reserve balance of $2,250,000. The committee recommends the approval of the 2021 budget development calendar and the operations budget principles as modified by the committee. The committee added new principles to be used this year. They relate to ignoring for budget purposes the presence of the payroll protection loan as it remains a liability. And secondly, to keep in mind that potential effects of the COVID pandemic, uh, that the, 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 the potential effects that the COVID, the COVID pandemic could have both on revenues and expenses. expenses. Uh, these last two principles were listed in the draft that is now uh, part of the packet. Uh, finally, the committee also began the discussion of alternative uses of funds that would be generated from the potential sale of the medical center building. A summary of those discussions is contained in a memorandum attached to the report and part of the packet. Uh, any questions? 
Okay, thank you, Bill. Oh, right. I just want to applaud the efforts of Bill and the Finance Committee for fully vetting a lot of issues. And uh, I think it's a great uh, the tool for the board. So thank you, Bill, and your committee members. Thank you. Any other questions for Bill? Ken. Yeah, I'd like to know if that if we do not approve the $135,000 for the wet, uh, water reclamation center, does that endanger any of the other the, the the whole process, such as permitting? We were we were told by we were told by uh, uh, Jeff that uh, it's a it's a process that uh, the, the decision could be could be put off for a month or two without any uh, uh, ill effects on any of the timing. Uh, I don't know if Jeff or uh, Dwight maybe, or uh, is, that, is that responsive? So the, uh, this is gonna be an agenda item here in a little while. We can discuss that a little bit further then, uh, but it's a long-term project. So that wouldn't jeopardize permitting. Any other questions for Bill? Okay, now we'll move to, uh, I need a motion to approve the 2021 budget development calendar. Dwight? So moved. Second, someone? I second it. Okay, Kathleen, second. Uh, any discussion? Okay, so uh, roll call vote, please. Kelso? Yes. Stumfell? Yes. Harrington? Hold on. I have to unmute you. Let me find your phone, Dale. He says you? yes. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Walker? Yes. Adams? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Okay, it doesn't. Oops. Sorry. Forgot one. <laughs> oh, Kikuchi, I, yeah. I apologize. Yes. I'm so yes. sorry. <laughs> okay, is that a yes, John? Yeah. Yes, oh. that's right. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, passes unanimously. Now we have the uh, operations budget principles. Now, the last time I looked, on assembly, I just checked again. I did not see the uh, COVID uh, principle or the PPP principle. So I just wanna make sure that whatever we're adopting includes that uh, because that, that those are significant uh, principles. So- um, Would you like me to read those? Uh, go ahead, those two, yes. Yes, uh, would be item number 21, the Paycheck Protection Program Funds are not to be taken into consideration. And item number 22 would be the budget will take into consideration the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, great. Uh, we have a motion to adopt the uh, budget principles up through 22. Okay, Dwight. So second. Carl, Carl second. Okay. Any discussion? So just to be clear, um, we do have to make projections about what might be in place for next year, which will undoubtedly be before, or most likely be uh, before a vaccine. So the, taking into account the COVID situation means that there could be some significant staffing increases that we'll have to consider. So just wanna make sure that that's clear for everyone. Um, Let's try a, a vote just of raising hands since I can see everyone and it'll save time. So all in favor, say yeah, uh, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like it passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, now the Golf Advisory Committee report from John. Hey, good morning. Um, I have a couple of thank yous to start with. I like to uh, Thank Ken Anderson for his service to our committee last year and welcome and thank Kathleen Stumpel for taking on the, uh, the role for this year. Uh, we had uh, our first CAC Zoom meeting since uh, uh, February 
and want to thank uh, Lisa and Deborah for holding our hands as we got through that one. The financial reports are in, included uh, with the board packet. They include the rounds played, the revenue stream from those rounds, uh, the director of golf's report, and the superintendent's report. Um, I have two other items that I just uh, like to have some time with today. Uh, one is water. Uh, and that's an advisement that the golf course is going to enter stage two of the drought plan, which means there'll be water shut off. Uh, the areas where the water will be shut off is uh, basically along Rossmore Parkway from an area that extends probably from about the, the uh, gateway area up to the pickleball courts. So basically along the roadway there. Um, the second area is along the border of the second hole of the fairway on the Creekside course. And I know that's probably not a real helpful description for those who aren't familiar with the golf course, uh, but it's uh, out there and it's, and it's a border area. Uh, so those two things are uh, informational. We do have a request uh, and made a motion through the golf advisory committee meeting to uh, recommend that the board modify the uh, death access policy uh, currently during COVID, no deaths are allowed to play. Um, under normal circumstances, guests are uh, allowed to play uh, without having the resident play in the foursome. But this motion is doing is trying to find that balance point between allowing guests to play and the safety of the residents. Uh, we feel we've struck that. What we're looking for is for guests being allowed to play only when they're accompanied with a resident. So uh, you, you may want to know that many of the guests of residents are family members. Um, we think that this is going to be uh, a, a prudent uh, addition uh, for the revenue stream, but also because all guests that play golf and in this request that we're making have to register at the uh, golf shop that they're going to play. Uh, they must play with the residents, as I've mentioned. They must adhere to our uh, protocols for golf, which um, are are, are known and reminded of by the golf staff and that we have marshals and player uh, or player assistants as you may want to call them uh, that monitor the golf course during play so we're uh, recommending that you allow uh, guests to play only when accompanied uh, with uh, the resident and uh, until such time as you know we can get back to normal um and i think that concludes my my report so we will be addressing that uh as one of our pandemic issues later on in the agenda item 11b so we're not going to take that up right now but are there any questions for john about the golf committee dwight so john uh in in consideration of your uh, committee's recommendation, one of the questions I have is in terms of capacity. Are you hearing any issues with residents not being able to get tea times or, you know, reduced capacity uh, would prevent us from allowing additional or ad allowing guests to play? No, that wouldn't be a problem. Mark has a, Mark, uh, obviously the pro shop staff has a real handle on um, historical um, uh, you know, streams of people, if you will, and, and uh, tea times are very sensitive that uh, residents do have access to the course. So it's not been a problem and we don't anticipate it will be a problem. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for John? Okay, thank you. Uh, John, we're gonna go to Compensation Committee report, Kathleen. Uh, hello, everyone. So the, uh, the compensation committee met last week uh, with important budget subjects to discuss and to produce recommendations to the board. The system GRF uses to populate the wage budget for next year consists of two money pools for all 
non-union represented employees. And, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, now. The first pool is the wage base increase. And uh, the second pool is a merit or market adjustment pool that was implemented for use primarily in performance and merit recognition of non-union staff as well as catching up employees whose pay levels fall through the bottom of their pay scale. Wages for Ross Moore employees is a large part of the budget for every year. For this year, 2020, the board budgeted over $8,700,000 for wages. So um, this is a big consideration. The base wage is normally increased some percent above the current year's wage for the non-union representative employees. The increase follows indicators as determined by GRF, which can be the Consumer Price Index, Urban, CPIU, uh, uh, ECI, or other indicators. The past four years, the CPIU has been used. The information we normally get for this indicator, is, as uh, all indicators, is only partial, partially available this year because of the economic shutdown. So this made a difficult problem for, G for GRF. Also, we don't know what will happen in the labor market for the rest of this year and for next year. So um, the base wage uh, slash market, uh, market merit pool, um, the, uh, let me see, the, com uh, the committee's concern involves both the base wage pool and the merit market pool for non-union employees. The committee recommends to the board that it approve a zero base wage adjustment and, and a $100,000 market adjustment pool for the non-union uh, represented employees. Last year, the market pool was 75,000. Uh, the higher the normal market uh, merit pool of 100,000 provides that monies are available for wage adjustment decisions and needs in 2021 due to the current economic uncertainties that make it difficult to determine base wage increases at this time. Whatever the board approves at this meeting is a budget plug and not a fi final decision. The budget will be adjusted and finally approved in, this, in uh, September when we have our budget meetings. So, um, we uh, are, are not going to discuss the, uh, the union uh, at this time because the, uh, um, the pending contract with the union, we won't know about until uh, beginning of next month. So we'll discuss that at the uh, compensation meeting in July. So, um, it, so is Robert, is it appropriate that I take make a motion now for them before or do you want to have discussion? Um, well, let's ask for questions and then uh, we'll uh, then we'll go to the motions. Are there any questions for Kathleen about the compensation committee meeting? Carl? Yes, I think it, it should be clear that we actually increase the adjustment pool so that we can make adjustments to salaries as needed so that uh, we can put people more in line. It's just not the base, not just people that fall off the bottom, but also to make base salary adjustments as needed to well-deserving employees. And it does not necessarily mean that everybody will receive no raise, but we are going to, to determine in the future what are appropriate raises or not. Any other questions for Kathleen? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd like to get a motion to, do you have a motion, Kathleen, for? Yes. So um, I make a motion that the board approve the committee's recommendation to the GRF board that it approve a uh, 100, oops, excuse me, that's not the first one I want to make. <clears throat> I make a motion that the board approve the committee's recommendation to the GF board that it approve a zero base wage adjustment for non-union representative employees. Second. Okay, discussion? Dale?
we have a little delay because Dale's on the phone and has to be unmuted by Deborah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, equitable treatment of non-represented employees means that they should be entitled to know a fixed amount of increase from us. I therefore believe that amount for this coming year should be the same as for the union employees and set forth in a specific percentage amount. If this motion fails that's before us now, I am prepared to offer a motion that provides a specific percentage amount of wage higher than 0%. Okay, any other, Carl and then Dwight. Yes, one of the problems we've had with fixed increases is that it, it originally in when we set this thing up, we made a commitment to pay people within their band as appropriate. Providing fixed wages means that many of employees are either over or underpaid because we may fix arrangements regardless of where their position is in the band, their seniority, their merits, et cetera. So we are attempting to try and move into a better position that better reflects the actual commitment to paying people slightly over market rate based on a lot of factors. And the only way we can achieve this is through variable in, uh, pay increases as opposed to fixed ones. Dwight? So, you know, it, it, it's extremely difficult to talk about uh, union versus non-union um, total job value. I think it's important to recognize that non-union wages uh, at GRF are double those of union wages. So the number is very large when we talk about a percentage increase on non-represented employees. Uh, union benefits tend to be double what GRF benefits are. So when you took, take, it's just so difficult to say we need to make things equal. Uh, a union contract is outside of the, the purview of what we're talking about right now. We're talking about $10 million worth of wages for GRF non-represented employees. Any other questions, or comments, uh, Dale? Yes, I, I, I appreciate what both of you gentlemen have said. And I'm just concerned that the non-represented employees might be really concerned if it's showing 0% and leaves them sort of hanging out. That's, that's my only uh, a concern about this. Okay, hey, Kathleen. So I, I would say that um, another possibility would be to uh, give give a um, like a five percent, so that um, we the the thing is we don't know what the contract is. It's um, uh, with the employees and what what that will mean. So um, we really have to wait, and things can be changed next month. If um, when we have the union contract, we know what's going on, or like I said, you know, we could, but um, but uh, to, to give a a, a finite uh, increase to the um, to the non-union employees now, uh, we can't really go back and and reduce it uh, later if we have to. But there's so much uncertainty now through the rest of the year and next year, as I said that makes this decision at this point very difficult. I'd like to go ahead and uh, call for a vote on this since we have a long agenda today. I think we, we're gonna be addressing this next month as well. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, have people uh, all in favor, raise your hands. Okay, so Sue, I can't see, did you raise your hand? Okay, so Neva, you didn't and so it looks like we have um, seven to two vote. Is that what you have, Deborah? Yes. Uh, all opposed? I guess we should go ahead and, okay, we have two. Okay, motion passes. Um, 
Now we have, I have a, a second. I have a second ahead. motion now. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I make a motion that the board approve the committee's recommendation to the GF, GRF board that it approve a one hundred thousand uh, dollar market adjustment merit pool for non union represented employees. Carl. Yes, I think this is more than a merit. I think we were talking about also base wage adjustments is not only a merit rule, but base wage adjustments. Okay, I'm looking for a second. Yeah. Do we have a second? Dwight? Okay, so discussion. Kathleen? So I think the idea is that this would be uh, money that would be um, more at the discretion of um, the staff because there are people who have worked very hard through this pandemic um, who need to be rewarded, not necessarily, um, you know, everyone w uh, has worked during this, but um, they would have the discretion to use it as they needed to. Okay. And that's why it's larger. Uh, John and then Carl. You're muted, John. Just to follow up to what Kathleen said, I think it is based on the notion that, uh, you know, merit can be uh, considered um, a consideration for all employees um, and uh, results in an increase in base wage. Carl? Yes. When, when this whole process started, we generally were giving below market raises to everybody across the board and it allowed a lot of people to fall to the bottom of their bands. We've made adjustments to bring them up to the bottom of the band, but there are a lot of deserving people that also need base wage adjustments. And I think it should be clear that this pool will also accommodate base wage adjustments for deserving employees. Any other comments on this, this uh, motion? Okay, so let's see a raise of hands. Uh, those in favor of the motion? So it looks like a unanimous, uh, nope, uh, okay. Oh, Neva's up, okay, a unanimous in favor. Okay, uh, do you have one more motion, Kathleen? Yes. Um, finally, uh, I make a motion that the board approve the committee's recommendation to the GFR board that it approve a 0% base wage increase for the CEO and that he be eligible for a merit award bonus as determined by the board. Um, oh, and oh, sorry. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, I was just going to add that this, I believe this um, merit would be. Uh, would be determined when his review is this fall. Okay. Dwight, are you seconding? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. Whoops, was that a discussion point, Dwight? No, I, I just wanna point out that this was requested by <laughs> Tim and, and I think a, a leader uh, generates a lot of goodwill uh, with a move like this. And Tim, we appreciate your sacrifices and great work for uh, all of us. Okay, all in favor, raise your hands. Okay, I see uh, unanimous, passed unanimously. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, planning committee, Carl. Yes, planning committee did a uh, general discussion of where we should go. And one of the things that we determined was we liked the idea of doing a study of a trail that would be usable by walkers since a lot of, since most of the trails are either on hard surfaces or awfully steep for people. And I think that walking the golf course has given us an indication that we might want to look at putting a, a trail that's uh, better for walkers, especially considering that a lot of walkers have 
uh, health issues. Uh, we will be meeting on uh, Thursday the 9th at 10 o'clock. And if anybody wants to participate in the planning committee Zoom, they're more than welcome. Any questions for Carl? We will be talking about that uh, walking path when we get to the board goals. So we'll have another opportunity to weigh in on that. Thank you, Carl. There's no unfinished business. So we're gonna move to new business. And um, Tim, why don't you give us a little summary of what pg and &E is asking for? <clears throat> I have two computers I'm managing. I'm trying to remember which one button I have to press. Um, let's see. So pg and &E had uh, several months ago approached us and asked to um, have Golden Rain grant them an easement to so that they can underground some utilities uh, up near their um, facility up at the top of Stanley Dollar Drive. The um, the work that would be done is there. The equipment, I should say, would be underground. It, it's an elevated site, so it's up on, on a hill. It's they they say it's not visible to uh, residents. It's going to be underground, so it even, even no matter what, it's not going to be visible, even if it was at a lower level. The closest structure is about 500 feet away. Uh, the closest golden rain, or I should say mutual structure, the water tank for East Bay Mud is, I think, about 85 feet away. So they have, um, we've gone back and forth now for several months. We've um, negotiated terms. We've negotiated the potential contract. And um, we have, uh, they've offered to reimburse us or to pay us for that easement. I believe, I don't have it right here in front of me, but I believe it was, I think $4,500. $4,500, yeah. Um, so the PG&E representatives are here on the call. They're, they're able to answer any questions that you might have. There's extensive information that we put in your packet. Once you approve, or if you approve, um, we'll then enter into the necessary agreements. We've, As I said, um, Tony Grafals, our attorney, has already reviewed everything. And so all the terms are acceptable to GRF. Um, so the, if, if uh, pg &E, if you have any questions for pg &E, they're willing and able to answer your, your questions. So I just want to say this, this is going to be great news. It will increase our reliability of pg and &E, uh, reduce the number of blackouts, brownouts that we suffer. And it, uh, seems like it's uh, a win-win situation, but pg and &E is available. If anyone has any questions, do I see Dwight? I'm wondering, uh, does it increase fire safety uh, issues? Yeah, PG &E. Joe Cruz with PG. Yeah, this is Joe Cruz with PG. &E. Uh, yes, yeah, so the new uh, feeder we're putting in, we're adhering to all the um, fire uh, hardening um, <clears throat> standards that we have in place. Uh, that's one main reason why we're going underground. And we are going to, um, as we go down further into what we call a tier three, we'll continue to underground. We only come up uh, where it's um, more of a accessibility to to uh, manage, and it, it it's not in into our tier two or tier three fire zones. This is all designed um, with the fire hardening in mind. Dwight? And, and just to follow up, are there other areas that are targeted for the same sort of fire hardening? Yeah, as we get further down into loft, yes, this, this circuit does go um, approximately 2.5 miles. So it does uh, go through the, the uh, Lafayette, city of Lafayette and the city of Moraga. And at those uh, locations, we are going to hardening uh, the, the lines that uh, that will be in 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 the path of the design path. Any other questions for pg and &E? Okay. Well, I'd like to. Uh, oh, Dale, go ahead. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I don't have a question. I have a compliment. 
I thank you for considering improving service to Rossmore and um, and and into the future. Anything that uh, that you can do that would help us. So thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions for PG&E or comments? Seeing none, let's. Uh, I'd like to get a motion to uh, authorize the CEO to uh, sign this uh, easement agreement. So moved. Okay, and Kathleen, are you seconding? Yes. Okay, uh, any discussion? Okay, let's see a raise the hand. Everybody in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Um, Carl, are you raising your hand for a yes? Okay, unanimous. Thank you, PG&E, for uh, staying online for, through all this. I think I'm going to call a, uh, a five-minute break now. Uh, it's almost an hour and a half since we've been in here. So, uh, But please be prompt in coming back at uh, 1031. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thanks everybody for being prompt there. So now we're going to address the pandemic impact on operations. And a lot of these questions have come up throughout the last several months and it's uh, time I think for staff to get some direction from the board. And um, Tim, I don't know if you wanna give a short um, introduction and then what we're gonna do is uh, there are six questions in the packet that we're going to actually address each one separately and take a vote on each one and uh, to give direction to the staff. So. so let me just give you a very brief overview here. So as everybody knows, the pandemic is affecting the world and, and us here in Rossmore. We still have not received any notification that there are any infections in Rossmore, which is, I think, a testimony to residents being careful and social distancing and, and doing their part uh, and the staff doing the same. So I want to acknowledge everybody's continued attention to that because that's going to be the key going forward is, is that um, we continue to sanitize, wash hands, social distance, shelter in place when we can and only leave your home when it's essential. So uh, as you know, we, we began the shutdowns on March 7th and the county's health order, which was the mandatory shelter in place was on March 17th. And then in May, the county began opening up things, allowing things to, to reopen. So uh, they allowed certain recreational activities to resume beginning on May 4th, which was golf, tennis, and pickleball. They allowed the dog park to open on June 5th. Outdoor dining was allowed at Creekside Grill on June 6th. The picnic and barbecue grounds opened June 10th. The um, outdoor pools at Hillside and Dollar opened June 12th with, by reservation. On June 17th, the county allowed us to begin planning to open the Tice Creek Fitness Center pool, which as I said earlier is opening today at one o'clock. And then any day we expect between now and probably July 1, we expect a new health order that will address the fitness center. So we're, everybody's anxiously awaiting that news. Uh, MOD um, has continued throughout the essential services of MOD, like landscaping, building maintenance, that sort of thing. Um, those have continued all throughout the uh, shutdown. But beginning in May, certain things like carpentry and plumbing and those kinds of repairs were now allowed by the county. So those crews uh, began working in May. Dwight mentioned the deficit at MOD. It was due to that period of time when there were no revenues that, that MOD was generating, which is a significant part of their revenue stream to help offset their expenses. So MOD is, is now fully operational, including the handyman service. Recreation department continues to creatively adapt to this pandemic by providing online classes, online entertainment, they're exploring a number of other possible live entertainment replacements. If you watched Channel 28 last Sunday night, you would have seen the first live concert from the event center. There was no audience, but there were two performers on the stage. The counseling office has continued to provide consultations remotely, so they're not working here in the office, uh, but they're doing counseling on the telephone with, with residents or on Zoom. 
The bus service has been operating on a limited basis, and that was recently expanded both for the number of people allowed on the bus. It was expanded from two to four. And then uh, there's been increased demand now that, uh, that residents are allowed to get out and be a little bit more mobile. So we're, we've increased the, um, the number of buses running. Securitas has continued to provide emergency services throughout, but the non-emergency services that they provide are limited. The Rossmore News and Channel 28 have never stopped um, their service. That, that has continued without interruption as, as an essential service. And I know that, as I mentioned in my report, that a lot of residents are very anxious to get back to, you know, resuming their normal lives as quickly as possible. And, uh, and then, as I said, we have others who are wondering why we're doing anything and, and rushing to open up any services or amenities. And, and again, I want to just highlight for those that might have joined the call, we've had um, a number of people join the call since we started the meeting that might have missed from my report. Every resident has to determine their own uh, self-assessment of their risk tolerance. That's really what it comes down to. It's, it's up to everybody to decide when you put your hand on your door, either to open the door of your home, to go outside or to allow somebody in, that dis that's a decision that you have to make because you're, you're op opening yourselves up to additional risk. So everybody has to evaluate that for themselves. And, um, and what we will continue to do for, with Golden Rain Foundation is to follow the restrictions published by the county, and then we will design appropriate safety protocols for our facilities. But just to keep in mind again that the protocols are not fail safe. So um, as Bob, Bob mentioned, we're at the point now as the county is allowing more and more things to open where I think it's appropriate for the board to weigh in on some answers to some general and, and a few specific questions. So in your board packet, you'll see six questions and um, we'll go through these one at a time. And ultimately, I think what we want is to get a consensus, a decision uh, on, on the part of the board as to what you want is, in terms of the answers to these questions. So the first question is when the county allows something to reopen, or to be further relaxed. Do you want Golden Rain to work as quickly as possible to reopen or adapt? Or would you like to set a targeted date range? For example, like a week or two weeks or 10 days from the time that the county issues the health order to the time that we open so that we're not rushing and we can ensure then that safety protocols are thoroughly vetted and developed, staff trained and the, the rules communicated to the community. So if you think back um, last month, you recall at the end of April when the county, uh, on the day, I think of the day before our board meeting at the end of April, the county issued a new health order that allowed golf courses to open. So that was on April 29th, and they allowed them to open on May 4th, which is the following Monday. So the announcement never made it into the newspaper. The only way we could communicate that was via Nixle and on the website. And people, most people in Rossmore are signed up for Nixle, and many people are, are usage on the website has increased significantly during this, this crisis. But this is a question that uh, some of you have, have asked me uh, specifically, you know, why are we rushing? Why do you feel compelled to open things once the county allows them to be open? Should we not take a little more time to be even more careful and thoughtful in the development of the protocol? So that's the first question. So uh, Bobby, you can open that up for discussion. Okay, Ken, and then Dale. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that we should not automatically open up our facilities just because Contra Costa County Health Organization authorizes it. Uh, our population is 100% at risk and we need to pay, have special precautions, I believe. Also, I wanna address this question about individual choice. It's not, that's, it's not that simple because if somebody take, makes a reckless choice to go out and, and risk catching COVID, they catch it and pass it on to me or one of my loved ones. I, I resent that. I don't, I think that's an oversimplification. Dale? You're still muted. Sorry. Um, Tim, what I think is that staff uh, should decide uh, how much time it should take to implement something because it, the, some items are going to be more complex than others. And so I'm not in favor of saying uh, a certain number of days automatically, regardless of what the feature is. 
Carl, Kathleen, and then Sue, and then John. Yes, I think on the other hand, before opening, I think the plans, et cetera, need to be divulged in case there are, are situations like in the case of the golf course where we had to make last minute adjust and plan after the fact. I think that if, you know, we need public comment before we open. Kathleen? Uh, well, to speak to what Carl uh, and Dale were saying, that um, we're not going to give them, say, you have to wait 10 days before you make any changes. We're just saying, in a general sense, we would like to um, not hurry to open things up as soon as possible, but to give uh, the staff time to put in uh, the new restrictions or lack of restrictions or whatever the protocols are going to be for each item and to give enough time, uh, like Carl was saying, to communicate this to the uh, community in, um, in a way that it all doesn't come as a surprise for everybody. And, um, and we can make individual decisions about what we're going to do, but um, just like a driver's license, um, what you do affects other people. And so, uh, you know, I think we have to be very careful with this population. Sue? Well, I think the way Tim put it is we got, I, I think Dale understood it the way I understood it. You're going to be either or you, and uh, either have us uh, do it immediately or give a certain day time. I agree. I think it should be just totally up to staff to see how they can do it um, most effectively. Because different different things are, the fitness center isn't gonna be something else, you know? They have different timelines for each opening, I'm quite sure. John? You're still muted. Sorry, my space bar isn't working. Um, so I think we, we do want uh, staff to be comfortable that they have vetted and trained and, and uh, gone through all the processes that make them comfortable without a, a set date. Um, I guess I wonder about the, you know, a couple of people have raised the issue of vetting with the community. And I, I guess I'm not entirely sure if that's been a part of this process and if we're suggesting that there be additional time for that. Um, time for what? For, you know, getting community input. Well, I don't think we're really, that that would just take too long and be too complicated. I think what we're talking about is communicating clearly to the residents what the process is. Okay. White yeah. and then Neva. Well, I was going to make a motion that we approve uh, item number one, uh, recognizing that it's a target for staff, um, so they don't have to rush, but they have time to do that. I okay. second that. So we have a motion and a second. Neva? Point of I order, I guess, or clarity. I'm not sure what that motion was. Uh, just a second. Let, let's hear Neva's comment, and then we'll go back and clarify. I th think that the motion should include that enough time be allowed to alert the community and also to involve the advisory committees that we have for golf, for aquatics, for the fitness center, whatever other advisory committees there are to have some input. That's the point of having an advisory committee. Yeah, just the problem with that is that they meet month, they were meeting bi-monthly, but I think we're changing that to monthly temporarily, but Given that, then we're potentially looking at uh, a month's delay. So they could call a special meeting. So I think it would be appropriate for the uh, the staff to contact them and see if they want to open, uh, you know, call a special meeting. But we can't wait for their regular meeting. So to clarify your uh, motion, Dwight, Ken was wanted clarification. So actually, my motion would read as as it stated in the agenda stated where in the agenda number item one. No, item number that asks that ask a question of which one should be 
in other words, the agenda says, should we open it immediately upon permission or wait a specific amount of time? That's why I'm, it's ambiguous. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> it, it really is. You guys, it, it, it looks like an either or. We don't want to do that, I don't think. I think we just want to give staff the opportunity to do their um, due diligence. That's all they have to do. I think Dwight's motion was set a targeted date range, seven to 10 days of delayed opening to ensure the safety protocols are thoroughly vetted and developed, staff trained and communicated to the community. Is that that's, that? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so that's the motion. Uh, are there other comments, Carl? And then I think I saw Kathleen and Ken. Yes, I, th I think that the number of days, I don't know that, I think that should be left up to staff discretion because some of these openings are gonna be fairly straightforward or certain relaxations. Others may take planning. And in some cases, staff may choose to bring in an advisory committee, even under with a special meeting, if the situation is fairly complex and there are decisions that should be made with resident input. I think the motion allows that. It says targeted, it doesn't say guaranteed, so that uh, there is enough flexibility in there. So Kathleen, and then Ken, and then Dale. Um, okay, so um, I'm a little confused. Like the, the second thing says, uh, because this is a high risk uh, population. Um, Point of order, President. This motion yes. has not been seconded. No, it hasn't right. been seconded. It was seconded. By whom? Um, by Sue. Okay, so Kathleen, sorry. Okay, yeah, so I, I'm uh, like a little confused because um, the second item is, because it's a high risk uh, group here in Rossmore, do you want GRF to develop safety precautions that are more restrictive than the counties? It sounds like in the first one, like you're saying, whatever the county says we're going to do, we're going to do. It's just a matter of are we going to do it, you know, like as soon as possible or is there going to be a time frame? So um, I, I want to just sort of make it clear that um, we may be talking about a 10-day time frame, but the restrictions may be more, more restrictive than the county. Right. That is going to be addressed in number two. Okay. That was just my point. Okay. So was it Carl or Ken next? Ken, Ken and then Dale, that's right. Ken. Yeah, I was in favor of leaving the uh, leaving it up to the staff. They've shown excellent judgment so far. And I wanted to leave it rather vague, but if, but you said that there was enough flexibility and that it's a target date and not an absolute date. I would be comfortable with that, but. Uh, yeah, it's just a target. It's just, it's not saying you have to do it. It's just to say that's sort of a general target. Dale? Yeah, if, if it's general, um, then that's fine. I don't like uh, them to be locked in to a specific date. And, and my second comment is that I would appreciate it before we vote if Deborah would read the, uh, the motion uh, for clarity. Okay, Deborah, do you have it to read? Sure. Okay. I have a, a motion was made and seconded by Dwight and Sue to set a targeted date range of seven to 10 days, delayed opening to ensure that safety protocols are thoroughly vetted and developed, staff trained and communicated to the community in advance of opening. Okay, so I think I'm gonna call for the vote now. All in favor, raise your hands. Okay, I see nine hands there, passes unanimously. Okay, we're gonna move on to number two now. So this is the question that uh, Kathleen was just addressing. Do we want the staff to develop protocols that are more strict than the county and state requirements? So this is a little vague. Uh, it's difficult to know. So we're, we are being then, um, we're depending on the staff to come up with those. And the question would be, are they gonna come back to the board with what those protocols are. So Tim, what is your thought about that? 
Well, I, I, I think that's part of what your discussion is. If you, if you want them to come back to the board, we can do that. Um, keep in mind that you meet once and occasionally twice a month. So there could, that could add additional time. And then also keep in mind that you've got a lot of pressure from residents to get these things open as quickly as possible. Um, Jeff, I see has a comment he wants to make on this as well. Okay. You just disappeared, Jeff. Sorry about that. Just just to give you a little background on how the process is, is working and it's different every time an order comes out. So for example, golf gave us five days in advance of a, a warning where other uh, modifications to the health order come out and say by five o'clock today, it's, it's gonna change. And the health orders tend to look at all facilities or programs, whether it's a, a private community like us or whether it's uh, general retail, the exact same way. Everything's classified the same. And for example, our, our pools, the uh, allowed attendance is much higher than what we're actually permitting. Uh, that's just because we're doing lap swim and it doesn't make sense to have 40 people standing around waiting for a lap compared to other pools that might be different. So what we do is evaluate how we can operate and then make sure it's within the health guidelines and, and rules and then proceed. So to be real rigid and say, follow the, the guidelines exactly would be difficult in many circumstances. Um, it, it just, every facility really is different. So we, we do need some flexibility in there. Yeah, I think in favor of flexibility. Um, the concern I have is, so we've got some feedback from someone here. Uh, the concern, I mean, the, the question in my mind is, are we talking about, and we're uh, going to address that, I guess, later on, but things like taking temperatures, um, uh, other uh, questionnaires. Um, so it's more flexibility that th this one is addressing in your mind, uh, not, not the, um, so giving numbers of people and things like that. Is that what we're talking about mostly? Well, again, it, it's... From the correspondence that both the board and I have received from residents, it, those that are, there's some people very, very concerned that why are we opening up anything? There's a pandemic, you know, what's the matter with you people? Those are the, that's the tone of the, some of the emails that we've gotten. So, so this, the idea here with this question is there is a level of concern among residents. I'm, I don't know that it's all residents, but on some level, it's probably everybody is concerned. Um, and some obviously more so than others. Do you want us to, as we design our protocols, do you want us to be even more careful or strict in terms of the, thing, the, the things that we're gonna implement and, and protective to minimize contact with people? So for example, um, we, I have several examples here in the next couple of questions, but like when they open up the, they allow indoor, what they call indoor gatherings or what we call meetings. When they allow those, and let's say that they have a stipulation that says you're six, everybody should be six feet away. Uh, all the chairs have to be separated by six feet or something like that. And maybe meetings can last no longer than 30 minutes. That might be one of the requirements that they, they impose on us. Do you want us to design a protocol that requires say 10 feet? Or do you want us to design a protocol that if the county says it's 30 minute meetings, should we limit it to 20 minute meetings just to be extra careful given our population, which is 100% at risk? I guess the concern is that in the past, we've based all of our decisions on the health department, which is backed by science. And if we start coming up with our own, that if there's basis for it, that's one thing. But if it's just an assumption that this will make an improvement, I'm a little concerned. But I'm going to open it up. I've been mo monopolizing things. So Dale and then Carl and then Sue. You're muted, Dale. Sorry. Um, Tim, as you were saying, <clears throat> when they come forth and, and give us permission to have gatherings in buildings, for instance, let's just say that they say up to, well, let's just say they allow 75 people. Well, 
if we have a club that wants to meet in one of the MPR rooms, uh, there's no way <laughs> that we could do 75. So you need to have the flexibility of telling a club, if you're going to meet in MPR uh, room two, then you can only have 15. Or as if, if a group is going to meet in the fireside room, then that you could do that. So you need to have that flexibility, Tim. Uh, Our, whoop, go ahead. Sorry, I, Tim. I, I'm expecting, you know, if we, if we look at some of the orders that they've already issued, for example, the pools, and initially their order was one person for every 300 square feet of water. And then the next order that came out a few days later said one person for every 75 square feet of water. So I'm expecting that they probably will have a similar guidance around buildings or facilities that when they allow it to be open, they might say like they've done with worship services. They've said uh, the capacity of the building, uh, whatever it was, 25 can't exceed 25 percent of capacity or something like that. So I'm expecting that when they do finally allow meetings or gatherings to occur indoors, that there's going to be some kind of limits around that. So again, my question comes back to just kind of general guidance here. Do you want us to be more strict? And let me just share with you something that you wouldn't know is that in my conversations with the public health director, uh, he told me, he said, your population is 100 percent at risk. You should be doing everything to discourage everybody from going outside of the door of their homes. That was his words to me. I put that out there in a couple months ago in, in the newspaper and in, in uh, I think in one of my CEO reports and have discussed this, but that's, that's the degree that he feels we should be doing throughout our community. So while that, is that science or not? I mean, that's coming from the public health officer, but he's not ordering us to do that. And he's not putting that in writing to us. He's telling me that, you know, on the telephone, he's saying you should be, your community should be extra, extra careful. So that's what's kind of driving this question. Do you want us to be at a higher standard than what the health orders are? Because the, as Jeff said, the health order is addressing the needs of the general population. It is not addressing the needs of our specific uh, age demographic, which is at high risk. Carl and then Sue and then yeah, Dwight. I, I agree totally. Plus the fact that we have other procedures for example, uh, trainer assessments. Are we going to get rid of the trainer assessments because that involves more close contact? Are we going to have people standing outside the fitness center in long lines waiting to get in? I think we need to give staff the flexibility to go beyond science and actually apply logic and reason. Sue and then Dwight. You know, I, I keep thinking about liability and I think we ought to just really stick to what the what is given to us by the authorities, because there's going to be people who think we ought to be a lot more stricter and there are people who are going to think they want to be less um, stricter. And we just say this is what the county guidelines are. I think we're covered. Uh, it, it's a better way to go. Dwight. Uh, so I was just going to say, well, I agree with both Carl and, and Sue that operationally there may be restrictions that are needed beyond. But the health, at least up to this point, it seems to me the county health department has been very cautious and conservative with their guidance. And where do you draw the line? We don't have medical experts on staff to help us draw a new line. Uh, so uh, operationally more restrictive, but uh, generally following the county. Kathleen? <clears throat> well, um, a, a thought that has occurred to me uh, all along is that um, they keep talking about these bubbles. Well, Rossmore is kind of a bubble because we're, we've all been careful. We've all been pretty much within Rossmore for a, a large part. So um, I think we can just maybe follow the guidelines within Rossmore, but discourage uh, people coming in and also indicate that uh, if we start getting any cases in Rossmore at all, you know, they do this, you know, they talk about contact trace and, and all this stuff that we immediately 
um, be more restrictive. Start limiting things like right away if, if anything like that happens. Because cases are going up in the county and, um, and Ross Moore doesn't have any. And so I think we need to protect our bubble um, w within Ross Moore and discourage people in Ross Moore from going into Walnut Creek to have dinner or to go to, to go shopping. Do things within Ross Moore. Don't go out. Uh, you know, you can't say you can't do that, but I would like to see that as a sort of a direction. And um, and then we you know we aren't health experts, so we can follow the county guidelines, uh, but operationally make them a little uh, stricter when necessary, as long as there are no cases within Rossmore. I sort of like uh, Dwight's and uh, Carl's comments about um, operationally, we may need to be stricter or decide to be stricter, but that we, it seems to me we're on tenuous ground when we start arbitrarily coming up with restrictions that unless there's some scientific basis for it. Um, and remember, people always have the option themselves to be more strict than what GRF allows. So that if you as an individual feel that you don't think this is a wise decision, then don't participate. Don't go to the fitness center, don't go to the pool. But those are my comments. So other comments, Ken? Yeah, I, I don't think science has anything to do with this because the county is making their decisions based on data and whatnot, but for a population that is very different from uh, Rosmore. Um, and we have a totally different population as 100% at risk. And uh, when their health director also says that we should be doing everything to protect us, I think our staff should be allowed the flexibility to make <clears throat> more restrictive elements than what is provided for the general younger population. I think the question comes down to, do we want to do what's right or what's popular? That's the way I see it coming down. Well, I just want to respond to that because I, I was suggesting the science part of it. I, the, with some of Tim's suggestions, uh, for example, having smaller meetings or shorter meetings, if there's no science behind that, then what's the justification for doing that? It's just someone's opinion about that's going to help us. So that's my concern is that I don't want it to be based on opinion. And either way, I think it should be re reviewed by the board, maybe not immediately, but at the next meeting, uh, we could just, if there's an issue or if a board member feels uh, uncomfortable with it, then we can certainly put it on the agenda. Carl? Yes, I think it ought, ought to be uh, clarified that when you take risky behavior, you're not only affecting yourself, but you're affecting the general population. And as a consequence, and I agree with Ken, these restrictions are a balance between risk and uh, reward. And what you're trying to do, what the county is trying to do is set this balance for the general population. But we really, other than the baseline, which the county has, and that's an opinion, it's not totally science. The science should say, you stay home, you don't go anywhere. What they're trying to do is assume a level of risk that is appropriate for the general population, but it's not appropriate for us. So in that essence, we have no guidelines scientific or not. Okay, uh, so does somebody feel like making a motion and we'll see where this goes? Carl? I move that we give staff latitude in setting uh, guidelines for uh, reopening that may be more strict than the general health guidelines set by I, the I second that. Okay, I second that. seconds. Do we have any discussion? I mean, that sounds general enough that I can support it. I guess I would just like to uh, say that if uh, something is implemented and any staff member feels like it needs review by the board that we can uh, put it on the agenda for a board meeting uh, and address it at that point. Any other comments, discussion, Kathleen, 
Ken? Well, I don't know if uh, it would be appropriate to add something uh, to this uh, about uh, if, if there are cases in Rossmore, or you know, if we start to find cases in Rossmore that the staff become stricter, uh, change regulations to become stricter. I, I don't know if that's a, a appropriate to put in or not. What do you think? Well, it's a, it would be an amendment. I personally, I think that if we may not find out, but it seems like that's, I don't know if that should govern all of Rossmore. There should be tracing and that person should be quarantined and anyone they've come in contact with, but I don't know if that should impact everybody in Rossmore because one person has it, but that's just my thoughts. Ken and then Dale. Yeah, I just want to repeat something I've already said uh, that I really trust the staff. They've shown excellent uh, judgment up to this point and they will know whether or not uh, I think to, that it's going to need to be brought to the uh, very next board meeting. Well, the board can members can decide that as well. So, Dale. Yes. Well, as the motion is uh, is uh, before us by Carl, I believe staff has the flexibility that they would need to go either way. Right. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor, raise your hands. Okay, so it looks like, Sue, is that a raised hand or not? It is, okay, so it looks like it passes unanimously. Okay, now number three. So if the county state do not require it, do you want GRF staff to restrict access to facilities so that indoor visitors are minimized? Now what this means by indoor visitors is residents or guests, so it's not just guests, it's to uh, minimize uh, contact between staff and residents indoors. So going into Gateway, going into MOD, things like that. So uh, my concern and question is as long as we can uh, have procedures in place so that business can be conducted, which I think we do now, then that seems okay by me. But John, did you have a question or? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you kind of answered this question uh, based on our our previous uh, conclusion, the answer to the second question. Well, this is uh, more about staff procedures. I mean, the, the second question, I think, was more due to uh, events, uh, uh, activities. This is This is sort of a business related. I mean, it could be considered, but I think they'd like to have it called out separately. So okay. um, Tim, do you have any more clarification on this item? Yeah, it's, it's very similar, John. I, I mean, the, 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 qu the previous question kind of answers that, but I, specifically, I wanna know, I, we're expecting that you know soon, in the next few weeks, it, it could be as soon as next week, the county could be issuing an, you know, the, an update to the order that allows indoor gatherings. So, I, we're envisioning, you know, what do we do? Throw open the door of Gateway and MOD and just allow the, the throngs to, to come in? Or because of the concerns that you and some of you have expressed and, and a number of people in the community, should we be more restrictive? Should we, uh, if the county doesn't require it, should we require it, say, to only allow X number of people into the Gateway building at a time? And then require others to wait outside at six foot, you know, with markings on the sidewalk that shows six feet and that kind of thing. So that that's kind of the direction I'm looking for here is, again, if the county doesn't require it, do you want us to? Because that that's that's one way that uh, businesses and and public health officials have limited access and and the groupings of people together in a in a confined space. So again, just taking it a step further. Do you want us to, if the county doesn't require it, do you still want us to do that? Okay, other questions, comments about this? Kathleen. Well, as far as conducting business, um, you know, the I think the uh, online uh, protocols have been pretty much set up, so I don't see any reason to not continue with those. And so if uh, if you're talking about um, like people having meetings or, uh, you know, some sort of event inside the building, 
uh, and the county says, yes, you can do that. Um, I would assume that there'll be restrictions like you have to have a mask or whatever. And then the next question is, you know, I think uh, about taking temperatures, um, screening residents and whatever. So I think that kind of covers the, that next question will cover the rest of it. But as far as the business is concerned, everything that can happen online should be happening online. Dale? Well, Tim first, uh, I guess, and then Dale. Yeah, I, I would just say that, that there's, um, so it, it surprisingly has gone relatively well for those residents that have adapted to using technology. In other words, computers and phones, you know, smartphones and that kind of thing. But a lot of residents, that's not a comfort place for them. And, uh, you know, we have transactional activities like at MOD, people coming in to clarify their statement or the, a charge that they've gotten or uh, a work order complaint. They really want to rattle somebody's cage. And so they march up there to, to, to express their unhappiness about a contractor or a staff member or, or a decision that their mutual makes. At alterations, you've got people that have to physically bring their plans in, uh, that kind of thing. So there, there's a lot of transactional things. And then things that happen here at Gateway, um, much of that is not going to happen, like ticket sales and that sort of a thing, because those are not allowed and those will probably be among the very last things that are allowed. But you know, the type of activity that happens at Gateway, there's a lot of people that come down here to ask questions. And we're expecting that to continue. They're, they're, they're calling now, which is fine. We'd like that to continue as long as possible. But again, once the health order gets changed and they start to allow indoor activities, do you, you know, we have these, we're going to have these questions. And so it, it's helpful to get your guidance before beforehand, because as soon as it gets publicized and it's announced in the newspaper and on the media and whatever, Residents are going to start demanding that they have, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you opened up? You know, and we want to be able to say, well, we've got to design the protocol. The board's got these other stipulations. We want to just be extra careful and so on. If that's what you want. If you're fine with the county guidelines, that's fine too. Um, you know, I'm on the younger end of the scale. I'm still at risk. Um, but I know as people get, you know, the highest risk categories are those over 80 years old. And that's a, a large segment of our population here. Dale? Yeah, not everyone here has computers. And even if they do, they're not necessarily uh, adept at doing a lot of things. And um, and they may not even have cell phones. So I'm in favor of, of uh, people physically being able to, to go in. And I know that uh, Tim would certainly set up the uh, distancing requirements and masks and that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm in favor of allowing people in. John? So I think um, we want to give staff the flexibility to come up with um, stricter rules if uh, it's deemed necessary because of the higher risk uh, population, uh, kind of consistent with what we decided in the last uh, discussion. Okay. Any other comments before, or does someone have a motion? Ken? You're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll make the motion that the GR staff has uh, give, be given the permission to restrict access to facilities so that indoor visitors are minimized if they deem necessary. Okay, is there a second? Dale, are you seconding? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Now discussion. So Dale, I mean, uh, Ken did add to the uh, the end of that. That's uh, what's in number three, if necessary. So that is, um, I think, appropriate. Any other discussion about this? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like unanimously passed. Now, number four, if the county state do not require it, do you want GRF staff to take temperatures, screen residents, and then sign a waiver before being allowed inside the buildings? I just wanna say, I think the waiver would be 
very difficult and time consuming and require a lot of staff. Carl? Yes, I also agree with you. I don't think there's a necessity for a waiver. Kathleen? Uh, I do uh, agree with the first two things on there that uh, the, the temperatures and the screening um, I think are a good idea, but not the waiver. Dale? I agree, uh, temperatures, but not the waiver. I had to sign two waivers yesterday uh, for services and it takes quite a quite a time to be able to do that. And if you have a lot of people coming in, it, it, it would really delay everything. And Tony has said that as long as we're at least as strict as the state or the county, uh, that we shouldn't have any liability. I mean, anyone can sue anyone at any time, obviously, but that if we're being stricter than the state, that we don't have much liability. Jeff, did you have a comment? In regards to the, the temperature check, uh, keep in mind that, that if staff is is now being required to take temperature checks of residents, uh, there's a pretty in-depth process to do that. And it's gonna take additional staffing and additional time to, to implement that. Um, we, we are always putting out for you know our staff as well as people coming in that you know, the general guidelines, if you have a fever, if you've been exposed, if you have a you know, cough, not to come, uh, but actually doing physical temperature checks as people enter buildings is a pretty daunting undertaking and, and will have some cost implications staffing wise. Well, significant cost. Uh, Kathleen? Uh, well, this is a question. Um, so in other countries, they're doing it extensively, uh, the temperature checks. And, um, and so I, I don't know that it would be more a staff. Uh, it's just where, you know, you just designate a person, like if you're going into MOD, the receptionist, it's just one of those forehead things. You know, you just touch the forehead um, and pass the person. I'm not sure you'd have to hire health people to uh, take the temperatures uh, in the old fashioned way. And uh, like I said, they're, they're doing it in, in lots of other countries extensively. Mark? I just wanted to offer that the golf shop's been open now for about two weeks. We have a line out front, uh, social distancing of six feet and masks are required. If I'm gonna have to have someone at the door doing that, it's gonna have to be another person on payroll doing that because I can't run back and forth from the door to the front counter to help that person and go back to the door again uh, for the next person. It will not only slow down dramatically, but it will um, hamper us able to move through anyone through the business. I mean, you're talking about people that come back in, forget, uh, they may enter the building four times in that line. They forgot to get a package of teas. Then they go back out, they come back, oh, I forgot my range bucket. So now I'm there every time they're entering, I'm, uh, I, it's, it's very difficult to do something like that when I don't have the manpower. John and then Carl. I was just wondering what was covered by the screen screening process. What's contemplated there? Tim? It would it would be the you know it's the health questions. Have you been okay. sick? Have you been near anybody that's had COVID? Have you had COVID yourself? So there, there's a series of questions that I think that are fairly typical that uh, that businesses and are using around the country. Right, okay. Carl and then Ann and then Kathleen. Well, I think one thing is if we do, I think it should be more up to staff, to, uh, staff uh, discretion. I understand that people enter, entering the shop, it's not particularly crowded and most of their activities are outdoor anyway, playing golf. I think that something like, uh, you know, and I think the other thing is, I think if we do me uh, measure temperatures, it should be touchless. Otherwise, we're going to have to have a whole array because once you touch a person with it, you need to clean the thermometer. I think that would be awkward. And? I know this because I just recently went to the eye doctor and I was talking with the lady who was taking the temperature screening. They had to bring in an extra person too. 
And she talked about the fact that you have to have somebody still at the desk manning the phone while the other person is taking the temperature check and as Carl pointed out, cleaning the instruments then before the next person comes in. So in my office, I only have one person working that front desk. I'd have to have a second who could then help the guests that are coming in the door. Jeff and then Dwight. So the thermometers are, are contactless, but you do need to get with closer than six feet. So you're breaking social distancing. The person doing the, the screening typically is has personal protective equipment. So there's and getting that on and, and off. And if you change shifts, uh, so you know, we put out for everything and it is so commonly known now that if you have a fever, if you've been exposed, if you have any symptoms to stay away from facilities and that's part of the guidelines we, we put out taking temperatures as people have already arrived if they have a fever uh, you're then exposing the people in line, you're exposing the, the staff person to that. It just adds a layer um, that I'm not sure has a lot of value to it. Uh, and, and it's a pretty in-depth process that you have to go through to do that. Dwight? I, I think item number four is too restrictive uh, and it should be rejected. Dale? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with uh, with Dwight. I've had my temperature screened about six times in the last month and a half, and it has not, uh, there has not been con physical contact. Like Jeff is saying, uh, it was able to be read uh, at, at a slight distance, but I'm, I, I'm not in favor of us proceeding with this. Kathleen? Uh, so I think the, um, the the screening questions would fall under you know the same category. You'd have to have more staff to do that, uh, it, so um, they would both be bad. But um, I think this could be um, just implemented for uh, larger gatherings. Um, you know, like um, in the future, if we have more than uh, you know larger gatherings inside that this could be used, but not for um, every time you go into the golf shop um, or you go into the newspaper shop or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, but we have something where there's uh, more people that it, I think it would be worth um, some sort of a screening or temperature check. So since that's probably quite a ways in the distance, we could address that at that time, Carl. Yes, I think I think it should be staff discretion, and I think we ought to eliminate the uh, the uh, uh, requirement for uh, a waiver. Well, I, I think staff is looking for input from us, so I don't think we want to have it just be staff discretion. I think we should make a decision whether the board wants them to take temperatures, realizing that if we do that, we're probably adding a very significant amount in labor. Ken and then Dale. Yeah, nobody is saying that we need to take temperatures everywhere all the time or whatnot. But I agree with um, Carl that, that that maybe the staff should have the option of going that route if some particular circumstances uh, would deem it advisable. Well, I don't see what circumstances would deem it advisable, except as Kathleen said, a very large meeting, but we're not going to have those in any time soon. Dale? Yeah, this can be taken up at any time in the future. I, I think we don't need to provide that right now. Dwight? I move that we reject item number four. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like it's uh, unanimous. Okay, thank you. Now, item number five, do you want to allow guests to use amenities subject to club rules during this time when amenities and facilities are not fully open and restricted and are restricted? Please be aware there's a significant economic impact if guests are not allowed 
or are restricted on the golf course. Golf Guest golf fees generate approximately 240,000 in annual revenue, which represents 25% of golf revenue. Guest usage of other amenities, for example, tennis, lawn bowling, et cetera, does not impact the budget. So discussion about this. Dale, Dwight. Uh, uh, do I understand that this specific, this will include uh, uh, guests for uh, golfers, like was brought up earlier, or is that a separate item coming up? No, this is this would include that. And just to be clear, um, there are guests playing on the golf course now, but they're called sponsored guests. They do pay in advance and get, uh, they have, I think, uh, tee times have to be after a certain time. So residents have preference there, but we do actually have guests now playing. What this would address is the people who don't, aren't called sponsored guests, people who come and play with their father or mother or grandfather, grandmother, or just friends that would come in. Now the golf um, committee did recommend that if we allow guests other than sponsored guests to play, that they must play with a resident, which under the old rules, they didn't have to. They uh, The resident could call and make a reservation. So Dale? Yes, I, I will be as brief as I can, but I've given a lot of pre-thought to this and I have five quick points I'm gonna bring up. Number one, obviously it would increase income for the golf program and that would be welcomed. Number two, allowing people from the outside to come to Rossmore increases the risk to our residents of contracting COVID-19 since our population is at the vulnerable risk age. Number three, since people from the outside may not have had the benefit of the excellent level of protection information that Tim, our staff, Channel 28 and the Rossmore News has provided to us here in Rossmore, people outside may not be as cautious. Number four, if we permit guest golfing, it will be the responsibility of our golfers to closely monitor their guests to make sure they conform to our safeguards. And lastly, if even one of our residents contracts COVID-19 traceable to a visiting golfer, I will vote in a flash to rescind the action. I just want to point out that there are lots of guests coming in and visiting, walking, doing all kinds of other things. We're just talking about uh, golf and other clubs at this point. It's nothing to do with restricting guests coming into the Valley. Kathleen and then Sue and then Carl. So um, the golf committee, when they discussed this, they didn't want to um, open up golf to everyone, but they did suggest that uh, people be able to golf uh, with a resident, a visitor with a resident. And this is because there are people here who golf with their son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter who don't live here. And so uh, it's kind of a compromise between, uh, you know, in the past, I could call up and make a tea time for a friend of mine and not golf with him. Um, but this is to allow people to golf with their like close friends or relatives that they normally would be seeing anyway. Um, so I think that's um, uh, an okay thing to, to have. And as far as other facilities, I think uh, it would be the same sort of a thing that it, you can use the facilities uh, with a resident, but you, there's no resident, no guests that can come in and on their own and do anything. And that, that restricts the number of guests that would come in. Sue? I wanna hear what Jeff has to say first. Okay. Just uh, how we've been doing it so far for as we've opened amenities is we've said for residents only. Uh, for example, all of the, the bocce course, tennis course, lawn bowling, uh, as we've opened the pools, we have said for residents only, no, no guests right now. And that is really based on 
the number of restrictions we have in place in a reservation system, we want to make sure residents are getting those spots. But also, it, it's limiting you know exposure uh, from from outside. As we get into golf, one of the the main interests. Uh, for many residents is to golf with their family and friends. And that's what they really discussed at the golf advisory is being able to invite uh, somebody specific, but not open it up just to all guests, but make it specific to golfing with a resident. So a little more restrictive than we're, we're used to, but it, it's almost this needs to be on a case by case basis uh, based on the facility. When we open the fitness center, I think since it's going to be limited spots, you want to probably keep it to residents. Um, as there becomes space in lawn bowling and you can maybe increase, they, they have an interest in starting to bring in some, some guests still following all the rules. So it's it's kind of a case by case basis that you need to look at this rather than a, across the board. Sue? That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I think we ought to do it by case by case and let staff uh, guide us. Because they're the ones that are going to have to deal with it. So I don't think just let, let staff guide us on which, uh, what we do with each facility. Carl, did you have a comment? Yes, I, I just think that. Any guests coming in, whether they're playing golf or not, increases the exposure to all of us. And I think at this point, especially with the rising cases, uh, I can't see that, you know, that it's a good idea. Dwight? So I, I like the, um, the recommendation that the Golf Advisory Committee made that uh, golf be allowed to have uh, residents bring a guest. Uh, but uh, after hearing what Jeff said, I think we probably need to limit that to golf right now. Kathleen? I think the same thing would apply to tennis. Uh, you know, uh, so if you play tennis with your son or whatever, or a close friend, uh, it's outdoor. So, I mean, I, I think we can maybe say for outdoor things and at the discretion of the staff, um, but restricted to only uh, guests, family and friends um, playing or doing whatever activity with a guest. And the lawn bowling, I don't know if, uh, you know, I mean, I encourage restrictions. So, I don't think you can just open it up to the golf though and not to anything uh, not to say, you know, tennis can't have guests. Well, I like the idea of having it be up to the discretion of the staff as well. So that if they deem that there's capacity and that it's safe, that uh, we can make a decision. Maybe lawn bowling would be, but uh, you know, pickleball, well, they don't allow guests anyway, but something that's inside wouldn't be Dale. Yes. Um, I, I agree in expanding it. Uh, and I like the fact that golf has set up the procedure where the guest needs to be with a resident. And so I would want the same kind of thing in tennis or wherever it might be. Um, so I'm in favor of, of opening it up or making it possible, but definitely the requirement that whenever it's done, that there be a resident with the guest. Okay, so it sounds like maybe we should get, uh, does anyone have a motion, Kathleen? Uh, I, I just wanna uh, also say that, um, you know, for tennis um, in the past, they have other clubs come over and I don't think that would be considered um, in, in this category. So to have another whole club come over from somewhere to have a, um, some sort of a tournament this wouldn't be included in this. Um, Mark has something to say. Mark? I've got a couple of comments. I think, uh, first of all, golf was found to be much earlier in this process. Remember, we opened up May 5th to be a contactless uh, situation, uh, whether it was residents or guests, and uh, we've been proceeding that way. Really, the only contact we'd have would be uh, at the golf shop with these guests if we had them in. And again, we have six foot distancing and masks. If we wanna look at that small pod of people the resident sponsor guest that uh, Bob mentioned earlier, that's a test case. 
they've been playing here since May 5th and we have not had any outbreaks and we have not had any problems here at the golf shop with that group because they're under the same rules even though that small group of 40 people comes from outside to play because they pay $1,200 uh, back in January to be part of that group. So we've had no problems because we're under the rules we're under and because of the way golf is, is played. And um, I think that's important to remember. Um, we do have the extra uh, Kathleen point of these outside tournaments. We were supposed to have several this year. We get a lot Mark, of income. Mark, let me let me interrupt you. We're going to deal with tournaments next. Okay, sorry. Yep. Jeff, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to uh, answer the question in regards to outside tournaments. Guest guest play would not include outside tournament for like home and home with tennis so or lawn bowling or table tennis or any of those types of functions as of yet. Mark's gonna talk about tournaments in a different form, but guest play would simply be uh, somebody being with a resident enjoying one of those facilities, but not, not the home and home club tournaments as of yet. So I think we're ready for a motion. Who would like to make a motion? It sounds like we're, Dwight. So I would move that we allow for guests. What did you just say, Jeff? <laughs> guests uh, playing with a resident. Guests play with a resident. And and deter and uh, up to staff discretion of, for each sport or activity. Yes. Is there a second? Okay, Sue seconds. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, Carl is not voting yes. Okay, so uh, all opposed. So we have one opposed, motion passes. Okay, now the last uh, category is uh, tournaments. Uh, so Mark, uh, why don't you give us a little brief discussion about tournaments? Sure, we have five events scheduled at this point between now and the end of the year. A couple of them were already scheduled uh, back last year. Some are moved from spring because they were uh, right in the middle of the outbreak and they were scheduled in May and we were able to uh, move the dates back. So right now there's five scheduled outside events. These are groups that would come in on a Monday when we're closed anyway. Uh, we would provide our carts, but obviously sanitize afterwards. There'd be no residents playing with them. They would simply check in, uh, go out and play and come back and leave. There is no, um, Previous years, of course, we'd have big events afterwards where we'd have the event center and they'd have food and prizes, et cetera. None of that's going to happen. It would be just playing of the golf tournament and that would be it for the day. Um, these could bring in anywhere between sixteen dollars and $20,000, the five that are left on my schedule. My first one is scheduled July 13th. It's a Monday um, from uh, a group. So, um, again, no crossing with residents. My clubs, my four clubs, just for information, like Jeff was saying earlier, my four clubs have canceled all of their guest days, home and homes and things like that that would be inner club events this year. So any questions, Kathleen? Uh, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear. So when you have these tournaments, no residents of Rossmore play in them at all? Um, they can't participate? It's just outside folks? In almost all five cases, now they, they could, they could, that would be up to them to sign up, but these events by their category are outside tournaments. So whether a resident has some affiliation with them, they might play, but I would say going on past history, 98% of the players, something like that, high 90s are gonna be uh, outside players. That's where we get the income of $52 per green fee. That's, that's why residents generally don't play in those because we're we're charging a premium number for them to play that day and that's why we get our income and help supplement our golf program. Kathleen and then Dale. Um, is it possible to um, not allow residents to play in these outside tournaments at all? We could, yeah, we, we certainly could do that. Dale? Yeah. Uh, I have total confidence in Mark as the golf sheriff around here. Dwight? 
to me, these tournaments are a self-contained bubble. And even if a resident decides they want to opt in and play with it, that's their, that's their risk. But uh, I, I think we should approve these. Any other questions, comments, Carl? Yes. In your report, you mentioned something about the Berkeley Country Club. Is that included in this? Uh, there is, a, I think we're talking about the Tilden uh, senior group. That would be the the uh, the title of the group that's on July 13th. So I think that's, Carl, I think that's the one you're referring to. That's the first one scheduled. And there'll be no residents playing in this. Correct. But it would interfere with walking on Mondays. Well, yes, we'd be open. Uh, the walking would be like, a, it would be like a normal... <laughs> if you remember normal in that we would have the nine hole golf course open all day and they could walk the in the morning but because it's a 12 o'clock shotgun so they could walk the morning on the dollar on that monday and then they could walk all day on creekside but from 12 to 5 we'd have a golf tournament and that was our normal situation with outside events pre-pandemic yeah, john i guess I, I guess i'm concerned about having walking before golf because of the problems of potentially clearing the golf course and also uh how do we handle uh notifying people that it's not a walking day or a limited walking generally what we've done before is we've uh always put articles in the paper but i would probably add in a nixle in this situation and talk to dennis bell about doing that since it's so unusual i mean we are in a in a different climate now than we were before, but before we just put it out in the paper. John, did you have a question? Comment? Yeah, so usually in these tournaments, uh, you know, people mingle at the outset and sit in their carts. Um, would you have any special provisions, um, you know, at the beginning of the tournament? Well, we generally have a check-in table. Masks have to be worn at check-in and things like that. The only place where people couldn't wear their masks. Or, or could not wear masks would be either when they're warming up, hitting balls in the range, or when they're actually playing. The rest of the time, masks would have to be used. And, at, and on, the distancing. Range, would there, on the range, would there be any special distancing provisions? Yeah, there's six foot distancing on the range. Yeah. Sue? I would really strongly suggest that you didn't have any walking at all on that day because people get confused anyway. And, um, and we've had trouble with them being confused. Uh, you know, you guys, I have seen somebody hit with a golf ball by a person on a golf course. It wasn't here. And it is deadly. Don't do that. Don't, if you can help it, keep people off of it. Dale? Yes, I do agree that we should not allow walking uh, in the morning on that day. I agree with Sue. It can be too confusing. Um, so I'm in favor of us just keeping it closed. We can just have Creekside open all day that day then for, for walking. Yes, and, and I have a question. If, an, if a walker coming in, I, I mean a golfer coming in from outside uh, and they don't have a mask, do we have masks that we can give to them, Mark? We, we do. Good, thank you. Hey, Kathleen. So, uh, so if we do this, uh, then, uh, then I'm in favor of, of not having as, any residents because, as you know, Dwight said, well, it's at their risk, but it's not just their risk. Um, you know, if they got COVID from an outside person, they might very well spread it within Rossmore. So I'd just like to, in this case, keep Rossmore completely separate from uh, this whole group of outsiders. Uh, how many people are normally in these uh tournaments, Mark? Um, they can vary quite a bit. Uh, this first one has, I believe, 40 or 45 people in it, so it's not gigantic. It's a smaller one. The other ones will be up in the um, 60 to 80 range. Yeah, so so I, I feel I, uh, that uh, it wouldn't be too much of a hardship to uh, not have any rather than just, a, a, you know, a couple, and that way we're completely separating from them. Dale? Yeah, Mark, I assume your staff would need to be treating the the golf carts and, and other kinds of things just like you do now. 
Uh, so that would add some extra uh, work for staff. Is that correct? That's true. We would be cleaning the carts that day and sanitizing after play, along with all areas around the golf shop. So, sure. Uh, when we have these outside tournaments, I just thinking about this, you know, they they really don't come into the golf shop. Uh, they check in out at a table outside. Uh, they hit balls and they go play. So uh, that lowers the amount of contacts that they're having uh, because they don't come in the shop on those days generally. They just check in and go play. So I think it's about time for a motion. Carl, last quest, last comment. Uh, I, I was wondering, the Berkeley Country Club does not have a facility to play golf. And if they do, uh, why are they playing here? It's a, a group from Tilden. It, the group is from Tilden. So Berkeley Country Club is a golf course. You are correct there. But this is a group from Tilden. They also have a golf course. Uh, it's a traveling group. They go all over and they've continued to do that. So they're not only playing our golf course, they're playing a different golf course each month. We just happen to be on their schedule. So there are traveling groups at golf clubs. Not unusual. So they, so they could play elsewhere. Yes, sir. But they're not paying us if they pay elsewhere. Kathleen? That is correct, sir. <laughs> You're muted, Kathleen. Sorry. Uh, I would like to make, make a motion that we allow these outside tournaments, uh, but um, restrict them to no residents uh, in, in the tournaments. Dale, is that a second? OK, we have a second. Any discussion? Carl. I think that the advantages are totally financial. I don't see it, it, that it benefits our residents in any other way. And I think considering the amount of money involved and the risk of people dying here, uh, I don't think we should do it. Dwight? I would like to suggest that, that it be restricted to Mondays only. Uh, and I would I, I am not in favor of dropping, telling a resident they can't play in something that they might want to. Sue? I agree that um, I don't think that we should stop the residents if they want to, because, you know, like the Rotary Club used to have it here that from Lafayette, they don't have a golf course there and there were people here. The other thing is, are all the all of the tournaments scheduled on a Monday, Mark? They are. Yes, all five are on Mondays. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor uh, to, and it includes restricting uh, residents from playing. So, all in favor of that motion, raise your hand. So we have one, two, three. Okay, all opposed. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, motion fails. Somebody have an alternative motion to propose? Dale? I, I, I don't have the wording for this, but, but the reason I voted no is that I think we should not exclude residents. So I'm in favor of the mo basic motion that was presented to us with, without the exclusion of our residents. Okay, I think we can work that out. Is there a second to that motion? Yes. Okay, Dwight, did you second it? Yes, I did. Okay, discussion. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Well, are you have a comment, Kathleen? No, um, I would just say that it, residents should be discouraged from uh, these tournaments. I don't know. I don't know how you would do that, though. Okay, all in favor of the motion? I have a question. Okay. Yeah, I, I got kicked off the internet by my modem, so I just got back to, I might have missed this, but are we talking about allowing a lot of outsiders to come in for something social, that's essentially show, uh, social, but not allow our own residents to participate? Is that where we are at now? It's financial. It's uh, five tournaments we have scheduled. Uh, no, re well, residents could play. Mark had said that rarely do residents play because there's a higher fee, $50 fee so residents usually don't play but kathleen had proposed a motion that would exclude residents that failed so now we have a motion that would allow residents to play and it's financial well i'm against any allowing a lot of outsiders to come in uh, for something social because okay. of our aged population 
Okay, well, any other comments before we vote? So all in favor of the motion to allow the tournaments, um, are you raising your hand in mo or do you have a comment? You're anxiously ready to vote. Okay, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, all opposed. One, two, three. Okay, motion passes. Okay, now we're going to, I think I'm gonna do uh, the, uh, well, we're going to do the PPP resolution. Uh, this hopefully is fairly non-controversial. It's just uh, uh, an updated version recommended by the attorney to sort of cover all of our bases uh, since we still don't know what uh, is gonna be required for forgiveness. So I don't think that there's much we need to talk about there. <laughs> I'd like to see a motion to approve the updated uh, PPP resolution. Dwight? So moved. Second, Carl? Yes, second. Okay. Carl seconds. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hands. Okay. Um, so it looks like everybody. Okay, passes unanimously. Okay, it's now uh, a little before noon. We can, let's see. Uh, I guess the next one is gonna be probably a little lengthy. Why don't we take another five minute break now? And so we'll meet back here at uh, 1157. Please be prompt and uh, we'll take up the next item. Okay, now we're going to talk about the uh, golf walker schedule and whether we want to continue um, with the current setup or modify the hours that we have. So any, we know that, um, well, the estimate is that we're losing but six to $7,000 a month possibly. Um, any other discussion, questions for Mark, Dale, Carl? Dale, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a question for Mark. I do have a comment. Um, it wasn't until we had all of the input from walkers that I learned about how some people need to have level ground to walk on that they can't walk on some of our trails and walking on the sidewalk is not necessarily uh, as um, as as uh, desirable so now there is the possibility and we'll be voting on it i guess of maybe developing a level additional level walking area and so my personal opinion is uh, for the benefit of those who need to have the level that we allow them to continue the present arrangement until such time as we have something that's suitable for them to walk on. Well, I want to be clear. We're talking about until the fitness center opens at this point. Uh, well, that's what it has been up to now. So we will be talking about something else, but that could be years away. So uh, yeah, but, we well, but, now, the, but the thing is, uh, uh, Bob, uh, not all of those people who are walking are walking because the fitness center is closed. Some of those would not use and probably do not use the fitness center. Um, and so this just opens up another, uh, uh, a, a more reasonable uh, opportunity for them. Well, we can see what happens with the um, motions as they proceed, but uh, Carl and then Kathleen and then Neva. Yes, and I think the other thing is, is we will be working on it at the planning committee. And if people want to attend on July 9th, I said June 9th, uh, we'll have uh, public input at that point. But I think we need to keep it open for now. Kathleen? Well, I think things are starting to open up, but uh, I think uh, leaving the walking until the fitness center opens is uh, probably uh, a good compromise 
uh, you know, we have limited swimming and we, you know, have some, some tennis, but it uh, really isn't opened up enough, I think, to limit the walkers yet. But, uh, but it is temporary. It, it will only be until the fitness center opens. Neva and then Dwight. I would like it. I would like it to continue past when the fitness center opens for people that walk and need to walk for exercise. Although I would say in the summer, it might, it would be great if we could have two morning walker hour, walking hours and then uh, when it's cooler and then start at six on Creekside. In other words, split the the hours available on Creekside between the morning and the afternoon because of the temperature this time of year. Well, we, we did discuss that and it's very difficult to clear the walkers off the course and provides, makes it very difficult for the marshals and the golfers. So that's why we decided just to do the afternoon. I agree it would be better that way, but it was not feasible. Dwight? I just wanted to ask Mark, uh, Mark, you quoted some numbers the other day at the finance committee meeting on uh, usage by walkers. And quite honestly, I wasn't listening. So I was wondering if you could repeat that. Uh, sure. I have my marshals keeping counts in the evenings. And there were some very good numbers of walkers early on in the first week or two. No doubt we had sometimes in an hour, we'd have 100 people out on the golf course. I was mentioning last Friday because uh, as we we we're talking about earlier, the, the weather is a factor for golf and walking for that matter. But uh, last Friday was a very nice day. Uh, the numbers were at, I believe it was 12 walkers at uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, I think it was. There were 19 at 5.30 and another 12 or something like that at 6.30. I don't have it right in front of me, but it was, it was that type of numbers. It was in the teens all last Friday. So it seems to me, observing it, that that weekdays and weekends, there is a drop in participation of walkers where we don't get the walkers on the golf course in the Creekside that we got early on. And uh, we certainly could fill that with the golfers. I, I wanna add one other comment here that I wrote down and that is that when I'm listening to conversations from residents, we seem to separate the golfers so often in the conversations from the rest of the community. They are a part of the community the reason why people like the Creekside Golf Course is for the exact reason that walkers like it. It's flat. They can get around it. They can walk it with a pull cart. We have participants who want to be on the golf course and can't because they're not, they, they want to play in the afternoons. They aren't allowed out there. We are losing those players and you're going to hear from them, I'm sure. Same thing from the woman this morning that talked about um, the, um, uh, during the residence forum, how important it is to connect outside and be in the fresh air and away from the confines of the homes and their masks. That's exactly why people play golf, to do those things. When you're eliminating them from the activity that this was supposed to be, you're taking away exactly the things that you that the walkers feel. So walkers and golfers are very similar. They want the same things. It's just that this particular field out here is built for golf. Well, I want to comment on the numbers because I've been going down with my dog most days at different times. And I see I've been trying to count. It's very difficult to count because people it is are difficult. All over. You can't see everything at once. My estimate is between 15 and 25 at any particular time. And it takes about a half an hour probably to walk the golf course. So if you take the hours that people are out there, which could be anywhere from four to five hours and divide it, that's, you know, we're talking about several hundred people in an afternoon, uh, we're not gonna get several hundred golfers out there. So I, I think we have to be careful about trying to measure the numbers. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, Carl, Sue, Dale. Yes, we are not restricting golfers from walking. And the other thing is we might wanna consider different ways when the fitness center opens up, we may wanna fi figure out different ways of reducing the hours. We may want, for example, to have walking on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays or something like that, or and one of the weekend days so that people can get their walking in and golfers can play later or 
we may want to set back the hours. I think we have a couple of different strategies that we want to may want to implement to reduce the walking time. I think we, until we get a trail or something like that, we might want uh, some walking, maybe just late evenings. I don't know. It's we have a number of options to consider. Sue and then Kathleen. You guys, um, that thing out there says golf park, park uh, golf, not not a park. And be careful because a lot of people buy property in here, a whole bunch of them, because there's a golf course on it. Um, it's really, you know, I got to tell you, there is a big issue on that. Uh, it's been discussed quite a bit. Um, are you going to just turn that into a park? And I've had to assure people it isn't. You guys also, uh, you know, you really have to be careful because it does say golf course out there. And if somebody's walking out there and if somebody's playing golf, you guys haven't lived till you've seen somebody hit in the back of the head with a golf ball. It is just awful. So be very careful. We have to think of the safety of this, of this, these residents also. Kathleen and then Dale. So I think we have to keep it simple. That was what we learned, the lesson I think we learned in the first place. So uh, I think different options for alternate days uh, or anything like that would be too confusing. Um, and I think that if the, um, if the fitness center is open, it gives a, and other things have, have been opening in the meantime, like we're talking about have possibly opening it up so you can have uh, outside exercise classes, maybe under this tent we're considering that there'll be enough of other options uh, for people that we just go back to as normal as we can get. And uh, when the fitness center opens, um, then no more walking on the golf course except for Mondays. Dale? Yeah, I'm in favor of continuing uh, what exists now. And then once other facilities open up, maybe once people can have partners with tennis and so forth, then we can take a look at the use of the uh, Creekside uh, uh, at that time and then make a, make a decision then. But right now, I think we should just leave it the way it is. John? Uh, I'd like to tie it to the opening of the fitness center um, with the pools open and the fitness center opening up. That was, that was, that was kind of the reason for restricting uh, or, or for allowing the walking. And so I think when fitness opens up, uh, we should uh, eliminate the walking. Dwight? Well, let Jeff go first. Okay, Jeff. Just a little bit of timing. Uh, the There has been a press release. The, the uh, Board of Supervisors also had a meeting where it was presented and it's it's looking like the fitness center will be able to open early July. We don't want to give a date right now, but uh, that should be happening fairly soon. As long as, according to what the county has released, uh, happens, that should should be early July. Dwight, so I was just going to suggest that maybe we want to allow like a two week time lag after the fitness center opens just to work out any kinks uh, and getting people back into the fitness center and classes started. But I think we should maintain the status quo uh, for two weeks beyond the fitness center opening date. Well, why don't we just say we'll deal with it at, at the July meeting? You know, that seems like a reasonable thing. Then we can evaluate the, whether the fitness center has capacity or not. Carl? Yeah, I kind of agree with you. I think we make a decision. For one thing, the fitness center probably won't open anywhere near the capacity that it originally had. I don't think, I think there's so many unknowns at this time. I think we should continue and then make a decision later on walking. Okay, uh, are we about ready for someone have a motion then? Okay, Kathleen. Uh, I'll make a motion that the uh, 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 walking on the Creekside Golf Course remain as it is, and we'll readdress this in um, July, depending, uh, and this will, well, that would be the motion. Second. Ken seconds. Any further discussion? Carl? 
you're muted. No. Okay, any other comments? All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like uh, passes unanimously. So we're at a little afternoon here. We have a very long item uh, next, the board goals. We can postpone that until next month. Uh, normally, that might be a problem, but given the situation that we have at hand with the pandemic and the staff being consumed with that, it probably doesn't um, make much difference, to be honest. Carl? I move that we postpone it till our next meeting. I don't think we need a motion for that. I think we can just uh, defer it to the next meeting. Is that right, Deborah? Yes, as a unanimous consent. Okay, is there a- Yeah, mine. Anybody opposed to deferring discussion of the goals to next meeting? Raise your hand if you're opposed. Okay, we're skipping that. Now we're going to uh, authorize the CEO to execute uh, Brizak and Associates, this is the water treatment plant, uh, $175,000. It was approved, but it was put on hold due to the pandemic. So there has been some concern about being in a drought and whether we should uh, make an exception for this. So Dale and then Carl. I vote that we defer that for further consideration at our July meeting. Carl? Yes, I, th I think we ought to move forward with it. I know finance is concerned, but with the reserve, I think this would, you know, the reserve is for conditions like this. And I really think that we need to move forward. It's going to take a long time to do. It's not a large amount of money. It, I mean, it is a bit, but compared to some other projects, and I think that uh, we obviously know that the golf course is important to the entire community, not just the golfers. Dwight? So uh, obviously, well, not obviously, the Finance Committee spent a lot of time uh, talking about this and it really re revolves around the target reserve amount to have in the trust estate fund. And given the diminished uh, member transfer fees, uh, if we, if the board approves the next two projects, we'll actually fall below that target reserve. And I just want to remind people the target reserve is, is actually the annual debt service that we have to pay. So if, if, if all hell broke loose, at least we would be able to pay the loans for the next year. And by the way, more hell could break loose with a fire, an earthquake. Uh, and so we, we need to keep a rainy day fund uh, intact as much as we can. Uh, to be conservative. Deborah? Yes, um, point of order, there's a motion on the table. I didn't get a second. Okay, uh, well, I, was it actually a motion? Yeah, yes, it was. Ready. Okay, well, is I'll there a second? That. Okay. Second just to get it on the floor. Okay, so the motion is to defer discussion of this until next month, if that's my recollection is correct. Okay, is there discussion of that? Any other discussion? Kathleen? Yeah, um, I think I also had heard um, from the Finance Committee meeting that uh, it really won't, or I think from Jeff, it really won't hurt anything to uh, put this off for a month, a month or two. And I think we're gonna have more information like in the loan forgiveness or the sale of the medical center. And we will know a little bit more in the future. And so putting it off um, uh, you know, maybe for two months uh, w would uh, not really hurt anything. Jeff? Uh, just a little background. So this is a, a long-term project, probably something that will take, and, and we've estimated it o over a four-year period to complete. Uh, delaying starting the process is, is one thing. Once you do start it, you don't want to do a lot of start and stop, start and stop. Uh, because you, you lose a lot of continuity. But if you delay starting uh, another couple months, uh, that, that probably won't hurt the overall schedule. Uh, we are in an ongoing drought and, and they're estimating that you know 
conditions could worsen. So we want to you know, be prepared to address that. That's the, the critical nature of this project. But delaying a, a start a few more months uh, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt the overall schedule, uh, but you don't want to do a lot of start and stopping. Carl? Yes, how much have we spent on this already? I don't have that exact figure. We've done uh, the feasibility study and uh, another minor update to that study, um, but I, I don't have that exact dollar amount of what that feasibility study was. Carl? Yes, I think that you know, Jeff is right. Once you start it, you've sort of made a commitment. Are we going to decommit from this? I, I don't see the point of the delay I think the point was financial, that uh, it's just keeping our reserve intact. But um, so the motion on the floor is to de defer it one month. Is that correct, Dale? OK. Uh, the, is there other discussion? OK. Uh, all in favor of the motion of deferring this for one month, raise your hand. Okay, so it looks like we have, okay, all opposed. Okay, motion passes, so we'll address this next month. Uh, next, we have the uh, air conditioning at Gateway. So Tim, I guess, or Jeff, who's going to give us a... So the uh, HVAC system at Gateway for the, the main buildings uh, was approved to be replaced actually in 2019. Uh, it, would, it took quite some time to get to the point where we were in deciding what uh, system to go with, how to redesign uh, for better efficiency and modernization and, and cost. Uh, we had decided on a, a new system and design that had been submitted to the city. Uh, I think we've spent about 15000 so far. Uh, it's ready to go to bid. Probably uh, due to you know, length of ordering materials and stuff, it still would take a little bit of time before we, we saw actual work start. But uh, the situation we're in right now being pretty critical is the system has already failed once this uh, early summer. Uh, it's a very old system. There's several issues with uh, leakage. The current uh, components and, and cooling uh, that it uses is going to be banned starting in 2021. So uh, if you have leaks beyond this year that either can't be repaired or can't be certified as being repaired, the system ends up getting condemned. So uh, it's pretty critical that this proceeds, especially if we start to open up facilities here at Gateway and you know, we, we do have some administration offices already in, in uh, function um, so it's somewhat of a critical need at this point. Carl? Yes, my understanding is this is going to come under the PG&E financing, uh, like the street lights. No, and, this... Uh, what's the status of the street? This project does not fall under that. Uh, it did not meet the qualifications for that program in that it, it the cost uh, exceeded the payback period to, to be included in that. Uh, the HVAC at Hillside and MOD fall under that program, but not at Gateway. Uh, so it's- Yeah, but this uses the R12, the older uh, refrigerant that is being banned. It's R22. Yes. Correct. I mean, to be, there are, there are alternatives, but that particular refrigerants being banned, there are very expensive alternatives, but more importantly, some of the leaks, if they're in evaporators and, and uh, condensing units and all that you can't see and fix, uh, those parts aren't available, I understand at this point. So other questions for Jeff or comments? Kathleen? I, mo I make a motion that we um, release the funds for the previously approved gateway HVAC project. Second. So Carl seconds. Any other discussion? 
All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, passes unanimously. And now the tent. Jeff, I guess uh, you're up again. So this is really a, an opportunity to try and provide some uh, extended outdoor opportunities for uh, classes, clubs, uh, programs, services, and so forth as indoor gatherings are going to be limited. Uh, outdoor is, is certainly safer. This would be a tent with no sides. Uh, we would use it at Gateway to begin with. Long term, we could use it at Dollar over the stage. We've rented one in the past for 4th of July and, and the outdoor concert series uh, works very well. Uh, but right now uh, with indoor restrictions, it's hard to find a shady place, especially that would be comfortable into the you know, afternoon hours. This would give us some opportunities to be able to expand and, and offer classes and, and programs, club gatherings in a little more comfortable area. Questions for Jeff? Dale. I, I don't have a question. I have a statement. Well, maybe the question is, this is not a tent as we normally think of a tent with sides and so forth. So maybe this has to be called a tent, but if it doesn't, in order for residents to understand, because I've received an email wondering why we need a tent, and I've explained that it's not a tent per se, it's like an overhead covering. So uh, this is just a comment. When we start publishing this, let's identify uh, identify it to that regard. Okay, Sue and then Dwight. I kind of have a question. Um, you suggested the, the stage out behind Dollar. What's preventing us from starting that there now? They have parking back there and stuff, or do you feel like it's because it's something for fitness, we need to start at the fitness center and, and segue over to that? Well, we're suggesting to begin with, while we're under the current restrictions, that we set it up in the courtyard here at Gateway. Uh, that way, we also have access to restroom facilities. Um, it's for classes and in different programs that we could do here. Long term, if we have indoor uh, access to all of our facilities, it could still be used by moving into the stage at, at Gateway during the summer months only. Then we take it down, put it away uh, to preserve it. Dwight? I move that we approve uh, up to $6,000 for a 40 by 40 uh, sunshade. Is that a better term, Dale? Canopy. <laughs> Canopy. I I'll second take that. it. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'll second that motion. Uh, Sue already did, but did you have a question or comment? I was just going to make the motion. Okay. Any other discussion? Carl? So I guess with six foot distancing, this would hold about, this could shade about 25 people or so. That's correct. Kathleen? Um, and so I just, I just want to make sure that it, um, because it partially cover, you know, partially restricts air movement, um, is it still, con are we sure that it's considered outdoor um, space and how tall is it? So like how much volume of air is in there? I, I don't have that exact dimension with me right now. I apologize. Uh, it, you know, I imagine it's about eight feet on the side. So uh, you have pretty good airflow. I wouldn't anticipate that we'd be able to find a exact ruling from the health director in their their health orders that would define what a, a covering would be. But because there's airflow, because you would still have uh, social distancing, uh, if you as soon as they allow any kind of outdoor gatherings, this this would be permitted. Right now, they're not uh, authorizing any gatherings. Um, so this is something that we're anticipating being able to utilize soon. Okay, any other questions or comments? All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like it's unanimous. Motion passes. 
Now we're moving on to uh, authorizing spending $2,000 from the operating fund to hire a registered forester to insist in the, assist in the preparation of an application for a forest improvement program grant. So uh, I know about this and I suggested Rebecca wouldn't have to be here and wait around this time to present it. It's the, uh, there are these grants available out there. Uh, they can be anywhere from several hundred thousand up to several million dollars. Uh, it's, they're designed to manage your forest. There's fire benefits and succession uh, planning that's involved in these. Uh, it's something we don't really have formalized in Rossmore. Uh, Rebecca is trying to do that, but it, it takes a lot of time and effort. So this grant, if we got it, would provide money to do that uh, forest planning. The, to apply for the grant, you have to use an authorized forest specialist or forget what their term is, forester. So that's what the $2,000 is for. If we got the grant, uh, we'd have to create the plan, which uh, is about $13,000 of which the grant can be used to pay for half. So we would have another $6,500 that we would have to come up with. However, we could get hundreds of thousands of dollars to help us manage our forest, which would be a great benefit for fire and uh, just succession planning as we see some of our trees getting old and, and dying. And we need to make sure that uh, Ross Moore is as beautiful as it is today in a hundred years. So Tim, did I miss anything on that? I, I see Rebecca is on the call. I'm not sure if she's still at her desk. Let's see if we can get her on. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry, Rebecca. I didn't mean to steal your thunder there. I just thought you could be outside doing some work, but go ahead. <laughs> no, that's okay. You pretty well covered it. Um, I will show you just a Google Earth map that I mocked up. So, um, you know, most people realize that we're surrounded by 700 acres of open space, which is just a pretty way of saying um, undeveloped area. And it's natural, and for the most part, we let it do it. We let it do its thing. Um, but you know, over the few, the last few centuries, humans have interacted and interfered with the natural processes. So now we really need to step in and do some replanting. Um, not erosion control, but erosion prevention and you know some fire prevention and stuff like that so i just wanted to show you the terrain of some of these areas and why it's so important that we have a professional forester do this for us and why this grant could be so helpful um so you know over here i don't know if you're aware but grf owns part of this area and you know look how steep this is um and if i put it on 3d you could see it even better you know, it's forested and there's ravines and we just, I'm not saying that there's anything unsafe about it now, but we do want to make sure that we have some sort of plan and some sort of professional in here that's taking a deep look at this so that we're not caught off guard by anything 10 years down the line. You know, so this is all our property here. Um, and it goes all the way around the valley. I'll turn the 3D back off so you can see it a little bit better. So, you know, it comes through here um, there's some some pretty intense terrain in here. And so anyway, again, just to have a plan to have an idea of what to expect out of the next 10 and 20 years, and then most importantly, have this application for the grant so that we could actually go ahead with some of that work. In the case that we didn't get the grant, I still think it would be a good idea to have the plan uh, so that we could apply for other grants in the future. Any questions for Rebecca, Dwight, and then Carl? Well, and largely because Rebecca pointed out the canyon behind my house, <laughs> I'm in full support of this, but I can't tell you how important the, the interface of our properties to the urban forest needs to be managed better. And I really applaud these efforts. Carl? Yes, I'm. T uh, we seem to be doing a great job of clearing on the ground level. However, I see that we do have crown fire problems, uh, potentially crown fire problems. We have certain uh, 
uh, slide areas that we need to address. And I think especially on the southern boundary, we have, we're adjacent to a wilderness area and we need to consider what we plant and uh, spread of fires. And I agree, we have some really aging trees that probably should be considered. I think it's a great idea. Just to clarify so everybody knows what to expect, this doesn't cover defensible space. It'll cover only the, you know, what's considered the forest land and CAL FIRE considers everything within 100 feet of buildings to be defensible space. And that's specifically excluded. Um, but, well, I shouldn't say specifically excluded, but this grant will not cover that. Any other questions for Rebecca? Kathleen. Uh, so I, I was brief, briefly kicked off, so I uh, I missed some. So um, I don't know if this was uh, answered already. Would this involve more tree planting or tree removal? Both. Okay, okay Dwight. I move that we approve the expenditure of $2,000 as recommended by staff. Second. Sue seconds, okay. Any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, yes, is unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now we're on the committee assignments. So you have in your packet the uh, selected new committee members, some being existing committee members. So I'll just read through them quickly. The Aquatics. Advisory Committee, Richard Giesner, Daryl Savoboda, and Lisa Hirsch, who will serve the remaining one-year portion of the resigning member Dale Reynolds three-year term. Audit Committee, Susan Hildreth, Glenn Oren, Deborah Thomas. Finance Committee, Deborah Thomas, Jerry Yearout. Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Harriet Crosby, James Grizel. Catherine Herdering, Virginia Rapp, Golf Advisory Committee, Michael Weiner. Does anyone have any objection to any of those um, appointees? Carl? Yes, I have a question. Do we, are we attempting to rotate people? Because some of these people I see have been around for a while and I think fresh blood is a great idea. Well, Interesting. If you read the packet, you see that that was one of the potential goals. So we will be talking about that next year. It is a consideration in the evaluation, but it's it's a balance because you have experienced people who do good work. But uh, right now, these are the people that are uh, have been chosen. So if there are no objections to these people, uh, I'd like to have a motion to approve this list of uh, candidates. Sue, I second. Okay, I second. The second came before the motion, but I think it'll still count. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay, everyone in favor, raise your hand. Okay, passes unanimously, thank you. Announcements, there will not be a mid-month regular meeting for the board in July, hooray. Uh, Bob? Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you have the chairman uh, approval from you as well? The committee chair. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. That. Okay. Uh, the chair. Chair people are going to be on the aquatics. Um, Brian Stack, the audit committee, is going to be John Kikuchi. Finance committee is Bill Dorman. Fitness is Catherine Herdering. Golf advisory is John McConnell. Sorry about that. Uh, there will not be a mid-month meeting in July. The next end of the month regular meeting will be on Zoom, 9 a.m. Thursday, July 30th. There will be an executive session here starting in 30 minutes. So please be prompt and we are recessed now until 105.